One minute to air. The live stream has started. Thirty seconds. live. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final vote on any issue before us tonight. Tonight's meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom virtual meeting platform. In this virtual meeting, platform, public participants do not have any ability to talk or be seen on video by default. To maintain meeting decorum and a discernible record of the meeting, the chat function has been disabled. Speakers will be given the ability to speak at the appropriate time in the meeting. If you have pre-registered, your name will be called for you to make your comments, just like in an in-person public hearing. If you called in before the meeting started and staff was able to get your information, your name will also be called to speak at the appropriate time. You may also call in during the meeting tonight by dialing 1-301-715-8592. If you call in during the meeting, you will need to wait until the particular public hearing you are interested in starts. After all of the pre-registered speakers have shared their comments, I will ask if there is anyone else wishing to speak. At that point, you will need to digitally raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. And when recognized, state your name and address and make your public comments. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative. So if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is not favorable. Thank you and may we have roll call. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, Grace Smith here with the Planning Department. I'm going to be ro uh, taking roll call and votes this evening. So uh, good to see you all. Uh, Chair Amendoya. Here. Commissioner Baker. Here. Uh, Commissioner Batista has indicated he will be absent. Uh, Commissioner Busby. Here. Vice Chair Cameron. Here. Commissioner Cutright. Here. Commissioner Durkin. Um, Chair, have you heard from Commissioner Durkin? Do you know if? Yes, Commissioner Durkin um, indicated she would not be able to make it. Um, okay, this. thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay, um, Commissioner Herod also indicated that um, he will not be attending this evening. Uh, Commissioner Lowe. Here. Commissioner McIver. I think MacGyver is absent for now. Um, have you heard from MacGyver, Chair? I am double checking, but I do not think so. Yeah, I don't I don't have anything either. Okay, um, so I'll mark him absent for now. If he shows up, we'll adjust accordingly. Um, Commissioner Morgan. Here. Commissioner Stace. Here. Commissioner uh, Carmen Williams. Here. And Commissioner Zuri Williams. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and make a request an excused absence for Commissioners Batista, Durkin, and Herod. So moved. Seconded. 
Moved by Commissioner Baker, seconded by Commissioner Morgan. May we have the roll call vote? Amendoya. Yes. Baker. Yes. Busby. Yes. Cameron. Yes. Cutright. Yes. Herod. Oh, Herod's absent. I'm sorry. Lowe. Yes. Uh, Morgan. Yes. Cease. Yes. Williams. Yes. And Zuri Williams. Yes. And uh, Chair, do you want to just circle back and we can handle uh, MacGyver if he doesn't make it? Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes and consistency statements from our May 10th meeting. Does anybody have any comments, questions, adjustments on the minutes? Um, I actually, I have, I just want to note for staff that I, um, I read through pretty quickly and identified a couple of typos, um, notably on page two under the courtyards at Farrington case under a commission discussion. Um, the Senate says the discussion center on ways to preserve or honor the historical natural of the site. Um, there's some, a couple of typos in that phrase. And then on page three, under uh, Park D, Griffin Residential Track, also in the Commission Destruction, uh, Northern Durham Parkway has a typo in it. There's a, it's like fixed spur way. It's, yeah, there's an S instead of an A. Um, so just wanted to flag for staff to review for typos. Apart from that, hearing no adjustments, um, can we get a motion to approve the minutes? This is Vice Chair Cameron. I move to approve the minutes with your corrections. Second. Moved by Vice Chair Cameron, seconded by Commissioner Baker. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, may we have the roll call vote? Uh, Grace, you're on mute. Oops, I didn't hit it. Thanks. Chair Amendola? Yes. Baker? Yes. Busby. Yes. Vice Chair Cameron. Yes. Cutright. Yes. Low. Yes. Um, I don't see MacGyver yet. Morgan. Oh wait, MacGyver is here. I see him. Um, there he is. <laughs> uh, so he's here. Uh, so my guy, MacGyver, we're uh, we're voting on minutes. No. Yep. Okay. Um, Morgan. Yes. Cease. Yes. Uh, Carmen Williams. Yes. And Zuri Williams. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any adjustments, requested adjustments to tonight's agenda? Uh, staff does not have any adjustments to the agenda. And we would like to state for the record that all um, public hearing notices were carried out. Um, as per UDA requirements of state law and are on file in the planning department. Thank you. Okay, before we get started with the public hearings, I'd like to take a moment to make a couple of announcements as a point of privilege. Uh, first off, on behalf of the Durham Planning Commission, I wanna say happy Pride Month. And I also wanna say happy Juneteenth for those that will be celebrating this weekend. Uh, secondly, there, I wanted to make folks aware that a privately initiated text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance or UDO was presented at the June 1st meeting of the Joint City County Planning Committee, JCCPC. Uh, you can find a recording of that meeting on the city's YouTube channel. For reference, the pro proposed text amendment is case number TC22-001. The proposed update um, the proposed update is relatively long and includes several substantive items. It's expected that the applicants will bring an update to this proposal to the August JCCPC meeting. And just to be clear, this is a privately initiated proposal, meaning it is not being proposed by Durham Planning Department. Uh, the rest of the year is already set to be a busy time for the Planning Commission. 
We have 11 rezonings just this month, and I'm aware we already have a fully booked meeting for August. Additionally, we'll be we'll begin holding public hearings related to the adoption of the new comprehensive plan this fall and into the winter. Um, so this this private privately initiated text amendment will also be coming through during the fall. So I wanted to put it on folks' radar because, because there are a lot of moving pieces over the next six months, and I want to ensure this receives proper attention. Uh, the planning department has set up a social pinpoint page for residents to review this application and make comments. That link will be posted later this week and will get shared um, on the planning department newsletter. Um, when the link is posted, um, it'll also that link will get shared again with the planning commission. Um, I've already tweeted out this link and I encourage everyone on this call to spread the word um, and use whatever communication channels you have to make sure folks are aware of it. Um, if you have trouble finding or accessing the link, please feel free to email me or email the, the planning department. With that, um, we're gonna turn to tonight's agenda. Um, and I do, I just wanna note, we have a lot of items to cover tonight and to, I wanna ensure we cover everything in an efficient and equitable manner. Um, so I am going to be more stringent on timekeeping than I typically am. And I also wanna flag that I will reserve the right to adjust the amount of time provided to speakers if it appears the meeting is behind schedule. Uh, with that, we will now begin with our first public hearing, case Z21-0012, and we will begin with the staff report. Thank you. Just uh, bear with me as I share my screen. All right, good evening, everyone. Are you able to see the presentation? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so this is Brooke Roper with the City County Planning Department. Tonight, I'm going to be talking through Z21-0012, Holder Broach Residential, or also known as Busley Downs. So the following information summarizes the application. The applicant proposes to change the zoning designation of one parcel of land located at 312, 325, 344, 401, 409, and uh, 415 and 417 Bro Broach Road and 4420 Holder Road. And this totals 5.828 acres. The current zoning is residential rural and the applicant proposes to change this designation to plan development residential 4.166. The property is currently designated low medium density residential on the future land use map. The proposed zoning is consistent with this designation. The proposal calls for 229 dwelling units consisting of single family and a minimum of 100 townhouse units. Again, the existing zoning is rural res or residential rural. The site is within a rural area and is surrounded by property zoned RR to the north, property zoned RR and RS20 to the east, and RR to the south, um, and then RR and RS20 to the west. There are also There is also a perennial stream to the west of the site. The aerial map shows the general location of the project. The site is currently vacant and primarily consists of wooded and grassy areas. Access to the site may be located at 10 different proposed access points surrounding the site along Holder Road, Broach Road, and other uh, various locations around the site. The applicant has included graphic and text commitments, including a 100 foot wide greenway easement, um, a, maximum of, a maximum of 1600 square feet of heated space for each townhouse, the reservation of 120 foot uh, feet of right of way for the proposed Northern Durham Parkway extension, along with uh, other design commitments. For the full list of commitments, uh, you can view attachment E of the staff report. So a 100 foot perennial stream buffer is located on the western portion of the site. 
There are also 0.82 acres of linear wetlands with a vehicular and or utility crossing shown uh, crossing that wetland on the site. The proposal commits to a 25 foot wetland buffer per the UDO. There are no steep slopes identified on the site. And the plan also commits to the minimum amount of required tree preservation of 20% and open space of 16% uh, per the UDO. The applicant has uh, proposed five feet of additional asphalt to be provided for the full frontage of the site along both sides of Roach Road, subject to NCDOT approval to allow for a bicycle lane. The de dedication of a 100 foot wide greenway easement and since the site is within the FJB watershed overlay, the proposal commits to a maximum impervious surface of 70% or 41.61 uh, acres. And for reference, the impervious surface limit associated with this overlay is 24% or up to 70% with stormwater control measures. A neighborhood meeting was held in accordance with the UDO requirements on February 17th, 2021, uh, with 21 community members present. And two social pinpoint comments were received by staff in relation to this case uh, seen in attachment L. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted ordinances and policies. Uh, staff and the applicant are available to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, at this time, we're going to open the public hearing. And uh, we have four individuals who indicated they're part of the applicant team. Um, those, that's Char Charlie Yokely, Nick Williamson, Laura Holliman, Andrew, and Andrew Eagle. Um, I believe, Laura, your kind of point on this. Um, did y'all have a presentation? Oh, I see. Nil Ghosh has raised his hand. No, are you? Yeah, I'll on this? point on this. I signed up for this one and the next one, so maybe that's okay. why. Yeah, I think your name got lost in the shuffle on this one somehow. Um, okay, great. Well, we'll have 10 minutes for um, the applicant presentation. Sure, I don't think I'll take nearly that long, but good evening, Chair Amendolia, Vice Chair Cameron, and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, I am Neil Ghosh with the Morningstar Law Group at 700 West Main Street in Durham. I'm representing the applicant for this project, Lennar Holmes. Also on the call tonight for the applicant team are Laura Holloman and Nick Williams from uh, McAdams and Andrew Eagle from Ramey Kemp. And, um, and I think Charlie Yokely also from Lennar is on. So I wanna thank uh, Ms. Roper for her presentation. I will say this project has been a long time coming. I believe we filed this case about 15 months ago. And honestly, I can't really tell you why it has taken so long to get this case on an agenda. I don't recall there being any novel issues associated with the case, but uh, you know, 15 months is much longer than we would have anticipated. Regardless, we are happy to be here today. As was mentioned, we are applying for a PDR zoning district at 4.166 dwelling units per acre. The total assemblage is a little more than 60 acres. And at full build out, this project could be around 229 units. We have committed to a minimum of 100 of the units being townhomes. Now, I think most of you, if not all of you, are probably familiar with Lennar. They have and are in the process of developing several communities in Durham. As one of the leading home builders in the region, they're able to plan across several projects to provide a variety of housing at various price points. This community is envisioned as a starter home community, and many of the text commitments reflect that. For Lennar, a starter home is one which will be more readily attainable to a first-time home buyer, but it also is large enough to accommodate a family. These are not efficiency units that you basically have to move out of once you want to start a family. So, for example, the townhomes planned in this community all will be surface parked, meaning they won't have garages. The townhomes also are not going to be giant units. We have committed to a cap on the size of townhomes of 1,600 square feet, and the interior townhome lots will be no more than 24 feet wide. Um, I believe this is reflected in the staff report already, but when Lennar filed this case 15 months ago, the anticipated price point for the townhomes was in the 250s, 
and the single family was in the 290s. Whether they still will be able to hit these price points given all the delay and movement and material costs and labor prices, I cannot say. But the point is that this community is meant to cater to that segment of the market. This is a starter home community. Many of these homes will likely be priced below the median sales price in Durham. And I think that is an important price point to hit. Aside from that, the project also provides a fair amount by way of infrastructure. This project commits to providing a traffic signal at the intersection of Mineral Springs and Holder uh, if it is warranted, you know, subject to NCDOT warrant. The project also commits to some intersection improvements at Holder and Broach, in addition to improvements at the site access point. The project commits to providing asphalt for bicycle travel along both sides of Broach Road and along the south side of Holder. Plus, the project will reserve right-of-way for the Northern Durham Parkway and provide an easement for a planned greenway. I also want to point your attention to commitment number 10. Without context, I think it's a little unclear, but basically this project will be giving, uh, I believe it's 0 0.65 acres of vacant land to the nearby church, adjacent to the church's existing cemetery. I suppose the church will be able to use that land uh, however they'd like, but our understanding is that they would plan to extend or expand their cemetery. So we are happy to be able to accommodate that. Um, we're eager to get your feedback. Our team is available to answer your questions. We hope to have your support tonight and, you know, look forward to uh, answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gush. With that, we'll turn to our resident comment. Uh, we have a couple of people that already signed up in advance. Um, when caught on, please state your name, address, and then make your comments. We'll begin uh, what we have, Jorge Luviano and Mimi Kessler, who have signed up. We'll begin with Jorge. Hi, uh, this is uh, Jorge Luviano from 1419 Pernock Road. Um, I wanted to know with, uh, if uh, this lot is rezoned, what does that mean for vacant lots around uh, Roach and Holder? Would, you know, would it be reconsidered by the county or city? for rezoning as well, or is it just, uh, you know, is it gonna stay, you know, rural residential for the rest? Yeah, Jorge, um, Jorge we, um, can, we can get to that question um, when we have our commissioner discussion. Um, at this time is available for you to make any further comments or raise any concerns that you have. have any further questions or concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, next up is Mimi Kessler. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Mimi Kessler. I live at 1418 Woodland Drive in Durham. Um, I am uh, I'm concerned with the iterative nature of, of these proposals and about the um, the um, um, if, if, I'm concerned that we're not looking at the aggregate uh, when it says in the staff report that there's sufficient, you know, water and sewer and so forth. Um, you know, at some point we're going to hit a max, and I don't know when that max is. And I'm I'm hoping that somebody in the planning department is monitoring that because with each one of these uh, developments and the annexations, um, we we create, you know, more water and sewage um, demand. I'm also concerned about the uh, tree uh, issue, though this particular project at least has some uh, commitment to um, salvage the natural areas. Uh, I'm also concerned about the schools. Um, the, uh, it's my understanding that the entire school system has to be more than 2% uh, over capacity in order for them to be able to expand any one school. And that's a state law. Um, and I'm concerned because of where all of these developments are ending up. I'm concerned about the schools being um, over capacity. Whereas I understand that when you, when the staff looks at each individual proposal, they are saying that there's capacity. But if you look at them in the aggregate, I begin to wonder about that. 
Um, so those are my main concerns, um, but I, I am pleased that this proposal does um, make a, a commitment to keeping naturalized areas. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. At this time, um, if there are other folks who would like to speak on this case, please go ahead and raise your hand at this time. Reminder that if you are on the phone, you raise your hand by pressing star nine. I see that Pamela Andrews already has their hand raised. Uh, Pamela, you'll have two minutes to provide comment. Please state your name and address and make your comments. Hi, my name is Pamela Andrews. I live at 6108 Wake Forest Highway in Durham. I'm calling, I'm calling a lot. I know you guys have heard my voice a lot, but I'm very, very concerned about our area. Um, the traffic, there are wrecks daily. There was one head-on collision today on Stallings. We had a fatality on 90 days, just days ago on June 3rd. Hospitals, schools, we hear the same ones over and over, but you know, medical facilities, we only have 1,400 beds in this county for hospitals. Where are we going to put all these extra residents that continue to come? It's a real concern when people have emergencies. They cannot be seen. I'm concerned about the blasting of these homes. There's another project on Doc Nichols by the same developer um, where there is blasting in their backyards. Um, there was an art a reporter yesterday, CBS 17, come out and looked at it. It's a real concern when you have blasting in your backyard feet away from your home to the point it's damaging wells and foundations. Um, an elderly couple lost water for two months, two months because of blasting. These are real concerns. And I ask you to please take a look at this. The waterways, the runoff, the tomato soup. I know you've seen my videos. I post a lot and share a lot. But please, please take this environment into consideration if you have more developments because we are hit very, very hard. And just might add, um, don't forget that Sharon Road comes out on Holder 2. We would need a stop right there. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Pamela. I see Betty Thomas has raised their hand. Betty, you'll have two minutes. Please state your name and address and make your comments. Yes, this is Clark Thomas of 504 Santee Road. I am speaking for my wife, Betty. A um, couple of general comments that would like to say. First off, appreciate the chair, vice chair, and all the commissioners for their public service. Um, the tomato soup that Ms. Andrews was talking about is, you know, our sediment and erosion control standards are set to a state standard, which basically is for the 40 micron particle, which is to allow aquatic species to be able to breathe oxygen. You know, like we have the 2.5 micron for human beings. If we get those type of particles, it will clog up our airways. Um, but with fish, it's 40 micron. And so I think we need to tighten up our standards, start using flocculants um, to get that clay particles out of the soil, out of the water. And then of course, we'll have to aerate that too. So that's one general thing. The, the other thing is, is that, um, you know, these are DOT roads that we're putting all this traffic on and there's not in the state transportation improvement plan there's not a lot of improvements proposed in East Durham. So, you know, while the county and the city may be proposing growth, it doesn't, even though it's not their roads, they are responsible for some of this traffic we're putting on. Um, and then ultimately taxes. You know, if, if somebody wants to live in a rural a setting and they've got five acres and then the 60 acres beside them is worth 10 million and the 60 acres on the other side is worth 10 million. Are they going to be taxed at the same rate that everybody else is, or is there going to be some, you know, equitable tax approach? So thank you for your time. Right on time. Thank you, Clark. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Please indicate by virtually raising your hand. I see we have a phone number um, that has raised their hand, um, the number ending in 7351. Uh, please state your name and address and make your comment. Hi, this is Wanda Allen, 2111 Radio Drive, Dorman T. 
Yes, I'm calling in, ref in reference to this development. I would also like to address the red settlement or what we call famously known as the tomato soup. Uh, you on the commission, as well as the city, and now as well as the state, are very much aware of the problems that we're having over there on Dr. Nichols and Carpenter Pond. Uh, this has been, uh, has been elevated. And I would highly recommend that we put a pause on another development until we get this concern under control. Uh, we have been issuing permits over there on Dr. Nichols and Carpenter Pond. I believe the uh, city and the county uh, director has informed me there's over 11 different permits that have been issued. So they are trying to gather the data uh, to see uh, the weekly inspection reports to see where the problem is coming. Uh, all this is public information. So I would highly recommend that we do not issue any more construction until we get this problem resolved. Why do we continue going down the road of making mistakes when we have the data showing that we've got a problem? That's all I have to share. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. Uh, I'm currently seeing no other hands raised to speak. So um, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing at this time and move forward to commissioner comment and question. Um, I first, I do want to address, I believe it was Jorge's question about if this site gets rezoned, does it mean that the adjacent properties will also be rezoned? Um, Jorge, it is, it is rare that the city will initiate rezonings itself. Um, so it is unlikely that because this parcel gets rezoned that the city would then say, oh, let's rezone the next ones. What is more likely is that a developer could find interest in the adjacent parcels um, and request a rezoning, but that is, it's kind of dependent on developer interest and if they see um, a, basically an opportunity to develop the site and profit from that. Um, but it will, it will most likely not be a scenario where the city decides to rezone nearby properties because this one gets rezoned. Who would like to start with questions and comments? Commissioner Baker. Just got one question um, regarding the uh, greenway. Uh, looks like the there's a greenway right of way that's being dedicated, um, but but it's not going to be improved. Is that a correct understanding that the the right of way will be dedicated, but not, um, but there won't actually be a greenway that's built. Um, that that question is for the developer. Sure. Um, so there's two different things. I, I just want to make sure we're clear on this. So we're dedicating right of way for Northern Durham Parkway. I believe that's 120 feet wide. Um, and I don't believe we'd be building any portion of that because it's not necessary for access to the site. And then we would also be granting a 100 foot wide easement for the greenway. We're not proposing any construction of the greenway. Um, for, um, I think staff, maybe it might be Erlene or someone else, um, is, so is there a reason why, can we not require that they construct the, the Greenway? Erlene Thomas, transportation. Um, so no, we... Cannot, we do not have a means under the UDO to require the construction of the Greenway. Um, and I also wanted to clarify that the development plan indicates the right of way for Northern Durham Parkway will be reserved. It's not being dedicated. So Thank you for the clarification. Um, and, and we can't require that. Is that, it seems like a rough proportionality thing. Um, is that just because of the Durham UDO specifically that we can't require that or is that 
something, are we limited in some way um, by sort of the um, uh, case law or state law or anything like that? I can say the UDO um, requires the dedication or reservation of the right of way, um, but we cannot require it. I'm not sure if there is any case law precedent that's been set. Um, normally the Parks and Recs Department um, addresses the, the trails and the constructions of those. Okay, so just in the UDO, it's written that way that we, we only require the right of way and, and we don't require the improvements. Correct. The improvements can only be required if it's needed to serve the development. The developer can volunteer to proffer the, the improvement if it so desires. Okay, that's all my questions. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Commissioner Carmen Williams. You're on mute, Commissioner. Carmen. That's unfortunate. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chair and Mendolia. I will be extremely brief with my comments because that's all that I have. Given the current state of development that is happening in Durham and <clears throat> pretty much everywhere, I have definite concerns about the rate at which we're building and looking at where things are. And of course, the price point, tree preservation is an issue, but my greater concern are the, are the residents and the amount of runoff and the things that are transpiring. And I think that it is a valid concern that we need to get to the bottom of what is happening in this area before we decide to move forward to add even more stress and strain on the environment in this area and these neighbors, and also try to figure out what it is that we're supposed to be doing. And I feel like as a planning commission, we are supposed to do just that. We're supposed to be the commission that helps plan and advise the city council on the best way to move forward. And I think it's time that we put our hands down for developers and start putting our hands up for residents. And with that being said, I'm citing and I'm, I'm voting resoundingly no for this project. And I believe that there should be a moratorium on this until further research is done and there's some type of resolution that is completed. And I believe that, you know, if you wanted to build in this area, do it within the restraints or the per permissions that are already there. Outside of that, let's not add anything to an area that's already heavily saturated. And we're still waiting on the things that we've already approved to get up and rolling. So we still don't know the impacts that are going to continue to develop. And I think that we just need to kind of hit pause right now and make a sensible move forward that's well calculated and well represented for the people that we're impacting. And I think that we can do that today. And I think we can do that beginning with this case. And yes, we do have numerous cases to go. However, I think this, this is just an already strained area. And I think that the I don't think that the ends will justify the means. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Williams. Commissioner Lowe, I saw you had your hand raised a moment ago. Did you have comment or question you wanted to add? Thank you, Chair Amadola. Yes, um, one of our residents spoke about lasting, if I heard that person correctly and how it had impacted the water or the well, and perhaps even the structural soundness of their resident. And I want to ask the developer, could he speak to that issue of blasting? Um, well, not really. I mean, I can tell you that no site work has been done uh, in relation to this project. now. Potentially, there has been blasting in the on. I think I think the neighbor said something about there being blasting associated with the project off Dr. Nichols Road. Um, I don't know which project that is, but I will say in general, you know, sometimes blasting is um, a part of the development process, particularly when there's surf, subsurface rock. Uh, this is a common issue in Rollsville, 
but it can happen anywhere. Um, this would be the first time that I was hearing about blasting um, kind of in this region. So I don't know that rock is prevalent, but we've not done any subsurface investigations. So I really can speak to whether blasting will be necessary on the site or not. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lowe. Commissioner Cease, um, Alex, Alexander, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I just thought it'd be a good time for us to address the um, student capacity numbers come up um, pretty often in our staff reports. And we just wanted to daylight that a little bit because that'll probably come up for the rest of the evening. Um, Planning does work very closely in tandem with Durham Public Schools to identify what their capacity is. Uh, it's not a perfect science and it's something that we are constantly trying to rehome, uh, but we do have a student generation uh, ratio that we work with based on the use type, you know, whether it's single family, multifamily, townhouse, duplex. Uh, and we work with Durham Public Schools to try to identify if that ratio is still accurate. And then we do look at the overall capacity for Durham Public Schools, not necessarily the school itself, but the capacity at large. Uh, I'm unable to speak to this 2% rule that uh, Ms. Kessler brought up, uh, but I can say that we are in constant conversation with DPS about these numbers. Uh, and while they're not a perfect science, they are something that we're constantly working with on them to hone in on and make better. Thank you, Alexander. Um, yeah, and I think that well, um, I do want to circle back around to some of the calculations on those impacts um, later on. Uh, Commissioner Cease. Thank you. I have a uh, two questions. One um, spawned by the question posed earlier about the Greenway. A question for the uh, applicant team. It looks as though nothing west of the required right-of-way de dedication for the Northern Durham Parkway is included in the buildable footprint area. And the Greenway easement that's shown to be dedicated coincides with the stream buffer, but there's residual land pretty much the entire distance from the north to south. And I'm, my question is why would the developer or would the developer or applicant team consider just uh, allocating that entire area west of the Northern Durham Parkway easement or allocating an area that includes a certain offset outside of the stream buffer for the greenway so that the greenway is not something that would have to be constructed within the stream buffer. So that's the first question. Commissioner Cease, I mean, our understanding is that the, the greenways typically are, so it's a hundred foot wide easement located overlapping, I guess, with, with the stream buffer, but that is a typical placement for a greenway. Our, the location shown on the development has been um, reviewed and, and, you know, I guess, commented upon by the planning department so, you know, I think that's the appropriate location for the Greenway easement. Now, I think your, your the second part of your question was, would we be willing to, well, I'm not exactly sure. What was the second part of the question? So the second part of the question, and this I think gets to the crux of the matter is in most instances, I think there's an expectation that allocating a Greenway easement outside of the stream buffer um, has an impact on the available developable land. And therefore it makes sense to allow it um, to be included within the stream buffer, but this is this is land that otherwise is is not um, not of any economic benefit certainly for the for the developer, and it would seem to afford flexibility for Parks and Rec or whatever entity ultimately constructs the greenway to do it in a manner that doesn't uh, impact the stream buffer. So my question, forget about the question of why. And maybe the question should be, well, would you consider doing it as an offset since it's not impactful? So this is the, you're speaking about the area west of the Northern Durham Parkway right-of-way reservation. Right, which is outside of the limits of 
you know, buildings and development for the project. Um, if I'm interpreting the development plan proposed site. No, I think, I think that that's, I think that's correct. Um, I mean, it's something we consider. I, I, I can't tell what? you. Why ahead. don't you? Well, I think I would be con, con, very content with the answer of having you consider that before this, when this advances to the to council and and address it then. Yeah. Okay. I think we can do that. I think I understand. Whether it's as an offset of the stream buffer or that area, it just there's so much uh, you know attention, and we we heard in the uh, discussion earlier the reference reference to to runoff. Um, you know, there's so much attention to protecting stream buffers and that the, the, there's a, you know, cost benefit to having the greenways. Yes, there's, uh, there's an understandable alignment of those within the stream buffers, but it, it would seem that in this case, there would be no um, negative impact on the economic aspect or even the livability aspect of the project to just allow the flexibility for that ultimately to be located just outside of the stream buffer. I guess that's my point. And it's a minor point, but I, I wanted to note it given the conversation previously. Yeah, I mean, I think we can work with staff uh, to confirm if they would be interested in that as well. I, I I understand and appreciate the point. Can't answer it now. Obviously, our engineering team would have to look at something like that, but I think that's something that we could consider. Second question, thank you. The second question then is I see, and you know, a lot of the discussion, your presentation addressed the um, multiple housing types, the two different housing types. I see a minimum of townhouses and I see a maximum of single family, but I don't see a maximum of townhouses. And I, am I, what, what am I missing there? Is it just- Oh, I, 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 I think I get your point. It could be all townhomes. Correct. Um, yeah, so I suppose the zoning condition uh, would allow for that. There was, uh, I believe a TIA conducted for this site, which, did not assume all townhomes, but um, yeah, I, I, I see your point. You're saying it could be all townhomes because there is no minimum required number of single family homes. Correct, unless I'm missing something. And that certainly is contrary to the way in which the project is being described. No, I, I don't think you're missing something. Um, and I think we could probably add a commitment to there being a minimum number of single family homes. Yeah, that, that, that would be, that would, seem to me to be appropriate just in terms of kind of a cohesiveness and a coherence to the proposal writ large. So thank you for considering that and hopefully you can get to that before we have to vote. Um, if I could make two more comments then uh, just general and and these are as much for my fellow commissioners and and um, and staff uh, and are, are, are both about the project but are, are more about the types of materials and, and information that we're provided with when we are considering these projects. First of all, the project itself um, really is suburban infill, if you will. It's an infill of an area that that has, um, a, 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 you know, not completely limited, but a somewhat limited number of connections that can be made. They've they've indicated those on the development plan, and it's it's not ideally suited for much else other than what's being proposed just in terms of present day considerations. And I understand from the public and others that there's considerations about what occurs as more and more of these uh, medium sized parcels get ticked off as development. But but in uh, the context of, of where this project is, I, you know, I, th I think there's a uh, um, there's a rationale behind what's being proposed. Um, and and I would in instances where there was more frontage on a higher um, uh, capacity road or a more major road, like some of the projects we've heard over the course of the past year in this area, I would um, be much more interested in having them configured in another way and incorporating more uses than just two houses, two housing types, which is really just a token, you know, token consideration. It's an important one, but it's really a token consideration to get to mixed use um, or some of the walkability aspects that, that we, uh, that are articulated in the comprehensive plan goals that have been adopted. Um, so I'm, I'm, that's a roundabout way to say it. I don't have a major problem with just with what's being proposed in terms of the uses. Once the item regarding a, you know, a maximum number of townhomes to ensure that there is a mix is addressed. 
But what I do have a problem with, and this is, I think, something that I hope staff can, in the coming months, help us address, is the checklist for um, the goals and objectives and demonstrating consistency or the ways in which the goals and objectives for the comprehensive plan policies are being addressed. And there's two that I'll just pick out real quickly here. Um, the goal of the environment, uh, objective, resilient, carbon neutral, biodiverse, generation, gener generationally oriented communities, page five of 16, is demonstrating um, that this proposal, or at least the box is checked, it's, it's checked by saying that there's other innovation. And um, this is a goal that addresses you know, carbon neutrality, um, stopping the emissions of greenhouse gases, retrofitting the built environment, um, more resilience. Uh, and um, the explanation references that the UDO doesn't really have any standards in this regard. Well, that shouldn't be a pass. <laughs> Um, whether the UDO has standards or not. And um, riparian buffers, stormwater, erosion controls, those things that are referenced in the comments as an like explanation are absolutely important, but they're not the um, core considerations that I think are critical for demonstrating the objective. And another box needs to be included on this checklist. I think I've mentioned this in prior meetings. It, it needs to, there needs to be a box that says it's not addressed because I think that's what the proposal that's before us doesn't address this. And that's, you know, if, if other things are considered, um, uh, you know, to, to be worthy in terms of the project, that that's fine, but we need to be forthright in stating that this isn't addressed. And to continue to operate with um, a, a checklist set of responses that doesn't capture, um, projects appropriately really devalues these goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan. So I have a problem with, with that. And that's, that's not a necessarily a comment on the project. That's, that's, it, yeah, although it's related to the project, it's a comment on kind of how we're addressing this in this checklist form. And I would say the same for the goal on transportation for the objective of connectivity, which is three of 16, page three of 16. And this one is to me more clear. The other one, you know, perhaps could be argued in some way. Um, the, you know, the, the goal and objective, connectivity. We need a better, continuous, more interconnected transportation system that lets people easily and conveniently walk, roll, ride, transit, bike, and drive to where they want and need to go. Where and how does this proposal meet the intent? The box is checked, demonstrated as a text commitment. The explanation references the TIA. The TIA does let me rephrase this carefully. The TIA, unless it explicitly addresses modal split, does nothing to address what's captured in this item uh, other than connectivity. Connectivity here is there dependent on how a few parcels change, but there's nothing about walk, roll, ride, transit, bike, and drive in any substantive meaningful fashion. And, and so I think, um, I, I would hope that staff can find a way to be far more discriminating and uh, careful in how these checklists are um, are completed in terms of not just submitting them to us as the planning commission, but submitting them as part of the public record, submitting them to uh, council in advance of a particular vote. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cease. Um, Alexander and Brooke, I both saw y'all pop up at one point. I wanted to give y'all a chance to make any. Absolutely. Hey, uh, Alexander here. Uh, so uh, I appreciate the, the points and you're describing some tensions that we worked through, Commissioner C. So I appreciate you daylighting that. Um, to be very transparent, that form that you're seeing is the old iteration. It's something that we try to come up with when the comprehensive plan goals and objectives were adopted. Um, it is not a form that we use any longer. Um, part of the problem with seeing cases that have been in the hopper a long time is you're seeing things that no longer exist or apply. It's a weird tension that we try to work through. Um, I'll have two other points to this. Uh, you're absolutely correct. You know, these goals and objectives are really great and uh, they can do some great things. We run into a regulatory environment that makes them very hard to implement without policies associated. 
Um, so our ask is that when we get these policies before you for the comprehensive plan, that they are what they need to be so we can see thoughtful intentional development that aligns with the goals and objectives. And the second part is if you have any ideas on what that would look like and you'd like to see, staff is more than happy to um, have a discussion about that or solicit ideas. Um, it's something that we have bounced around for well over a year now, tried to figure out how to implement. We struggled a little bit. Um, so any insight that you have between now and when the policies are adopted would be really helpful for staff. Great, thanks for that response. And the first part of what you said, I think is perhaps the most important is that there is a uh, lag time between the documents that are included in the cases when they come before us. And hopefully, um, you know, hopefully the, the more updated versions do in fact allow something not to be uh, mischaracterized and there's there's clarity of something isn't addressed out of those goals and objectives. Uh, so I appreciate you. I appreciate you uh, walking through that for us, Alexander. Um, and uh, thanks, thanks for thanks for describing that. Thank you all. Commissioner Busby. Thanks, Chairman Dahlia. Uh, mostly, I just wanted to note that uh, while I, I have a high level of respect for the staff and really appreciate all the work that you're doing and know you have a huge workload knowing that we have this meeting tonight with a big caseload and another next Thursday, I, I did just want to respectfully disagree with one, what I took to be an editorial comment uh, it's at the bottom of page five of the staff report and it says this development has a significant number of text design and graphic commitments. They have a few, but in my opinion, I think it just falls way short. I mean, to me, a proposal that had a lot of commitments was guess and lot of road. Uh, even our next case, which has a significant number of affordable housing commitments. Uh, I get what this proposal is looking to do. I think Commissioner Cease hit on a lot of things that that I agree with in terms of the location of this site and what might make sense and knowing our affordable housing and just housing in general uh, issues. But I'm planning to vote no on this proposal because I was actually quite struck and really disappointed in the number of places where it looked like we hit the bare minimum and then we stopped. And um, I vote yes on proposals for rezonings. I voted yes at Yes and Lada, and I vote yes on proposals where we see uh, commitments being made that are really helping advance the community and investing in our community. And I think this just struck me as mostly hitting the bare minimum with a few exceptions, uh, but I'm, I'm planning to vote no because I think our community needs and wants to see a lot more if we're gonna be working together. So th that's it for me, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Busby. Commissioner Cutright. Appreciate it. Um, this is this is just a question for uh, Neil. Just a really quick question. I'm I'm wondering, given the 15 month timeline uh, on this this particular case, I'm wondering like what, if any, things have been sacrificed given the sort of change in cost environment, construction costs, uh, was there at one point some consideration for other things that we've we've brought to the table before that you've heard on numerous cases, affordable housing, other commitments uh, that we think we'd like to see um, that have been taken out or, or, or struck from this particular development given the, the, the current uh, just cost environment. Um, th that's really my question. I'm just trying to understand, you know, as we're seeing this proposal, there's, there's not a lot of um, things that look really appealing about it outside of the fact that, you know, it's more supply. Um, but I also understand the, the, uh, the environment that we're in and, and, and just want to reconcile that if we can. Yes, yeah, so I appreciate the question. I will say, I mean, with the delays and, and length of this process, um, there certainly are some concerns about hitting, hitting the budget. The, the original idea of this community is to provide a community that 
um, would be like starter homes that wouldn't push up significantly the property values in the surrounding area if you know if that were to occur by providing product that is more affordable than you know a lot of other projects that you're seeing. So kind of the surface part, townhomes, that that is a measure that is meant to cut down on price. So when we originally submitted, these townhomes were pro forma at uh, to be in the 250s and the single families were pro forma to be in the 290s. Even at that time, those prices were considered under what at that time was Durham's medium price, median price range for, for townhomes and for single family. I mean, and it's, you know, I don't know what those numbers are today. Uh, it's hard for us to predict. I mean, if this project were to move forward from this point, uh, it, it still would be another, you know, two plus years before an actual house would be sold based on site plan approval and development timeline and all of that. And obviously the market has changed quite a bit in the last 15 months. So, you know, were there other things we were considering? I, I mean, no, I don't really think so. I think what we were considering is that this project was going to be able to provide affordable housing, um, you know, that is under the median price range that in Durham uh, without any kind of subsidy. This would be privately funded, no subsidy. That was the idea here. It's still the idea here. Just really can't tell you that we'd be hitting those, the same attractive price point there. Um, but ultimately this is a starter home community and you know there there are some limits on what can be done, and I think that this this project reflects that. But you know the idea here is to provide housing at a you know lower cost than you're seeing new construction homes generally come online for in Durham. I think that's accurate. Thank you for that. Um, Commissioner Zuri Williams, I saw you had your hand raised. Do you have comments or questions you would like to raise? Hey, um, uh, Commissioner Cutright and um, Mr. Ghosh pretty much hit the nail on the head. I was just wondering how accurate these numbers were in terms of um, the projected pricing, um, taking the 15 months into consideration. That looks like that was probably around March of 2020, so COVID. So just, yeah, that was that was my thought process. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Williams. Uh, Commissioner Cutright. Sorry, thank, thanks, Chair. Just a quick follow-up. Um, ha, has there been a, a consideration for um, maybe a donation to the Affordable Housing Fund or a donation of a lot or two or five to uh, maybe Durham Community Land Trust or something like that. Um, is that something you could consider in this proposal? Yeah, I mean, I don't really think we're uh, in a position to, to make that kind of commitment right now. I mean, I think uh, cer certainly not on the lot side. Um, the, given this project has been in the queue for so long, I mean, it is, there is some interest carry, obviously, especially with this project. Um, and, you know, to, to speak to Commissioner uh, Williams' point, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I was suggesting. I don't know how accurate that is. I mean, what I have read um, nationally, you know, construction costs for single family homes are going up, you know, about 30% in the same time frame. So, you know, I suspect we're not going to be hitting a 250 price point. Hard to say what we would be hitting. Um, but, you know, it's, again, the idea here is to run, to, to provide a community, you know, that is going to, to provide housing, which is attainable to many people, um, you know, without any kind of subsidy or anything like that. And so the margins are, you know, thin. And I don't know that we're in a position to commit to, capital A affordable housing uh, when our goal here is to provide market rate affordability under median price point. Thanks, appreciate that, Neil. Uh, just to be clear, I'm not asking for a capital A affordable housing. Um, you know, what I suggested was a uh, donation to the affordable housing fund. And you've been in front of us a million times, Neil. Uh, you sort of knew that question was coming. 
um, I, I, you know, I think a consideration of that in advance with your client would, would be appreciated, um, especially knowing that it, it wasn't on the table. I think that's, that's the ongoing theme here. Um, and so it's a bit disappointing when you come to the table um, and we don't, we hear that we can't consider that at this time, knowing full and well that that'll be an ask. Uh, if nothing else, it'll be an ask for a uh, donation to the affordable housing fund. Um, so I appreciate your, your response there and um, we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you, Commissioner Cartwright. Um, Alexander, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Chair Mendulia. Um, and just to, again, we're going to try to be very transparent uh, in these meetings. You know, from the first application submittal um, to the version you see now, there were no commitments removed um, due to a time in the process. Uh, but I'll also add there was no additional engagement done around the proposal, uh, which was an opportunity. And then lastly, we want to state that any of the prices that you see in a staff report are not commitments. Um, and that probably is more for the community watching. You know, the, they can be sold at whatever price that the market allows for that the applicant wants to um, post them at. Um, so that that is a number. Well, it provides context in the staff report. It is not a binding commitment. Thank you for that, Alexander. Um, OK, Mr. Ghosh, I see you raised your hand and I'll recognize you at this time. Thanks. I I'm just, I'm not sure what Alexander was referring to. I did want to, we did have at least two neighborhood meetings for this project. Um, one which occurred after our first submittal. And I, maybe I misheard, but I thought Alexander said there wasn't any additional engagement done. Uh, and I'm not sure what he's referring to, but just wanted to note, we did have two neighborhood meetings. One came after the initial submittal. Thank you, Mr. Gish. Um, Alexander, did you want to respond to that at all? Uh, there was a second meeting held that is correct um, that we won't debate the merits of whether that's additional engagement, but a second one was held by the applicant that was correct. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so first I want to touch on a point that came up during resident comment about looking at the aggregate impact of all of these, excuse me, all of these uh, recent cases and applications that have come through. Um, and so I'm going to state my understanding and ask staff to confirm or clarify. My understanding is that our impact analyses that we have on transportation, sewer, and schools all take into account everything that has been approved by the elected officials. Is that correct? Uh, it's a complicated answer that I'll try to answer clearly. And if Grace, if you want to jump in, feel free. Um, so for Durham Public Schools, it is based on their capacity. Um, so I don't believe it's based on each cumulative project that comes in. It's just per project, project specific. Um, for water and sewer, that is based on a um, cumulative capacity. So as new houses make connections, as new developments make connections, that is factored into water and sewer capacity in the lift stations. Um, for the third question uh, was capacity around transportation. Um, so. That one's a little more complicated. Uh, the transportation department might be able to speak that, to that a little bit better if early and still on. Erlene Thomas, transportation. Um, that too is sort of not as straightforward of an answer. Um, for, for developments that are required to do traffic studies, there is an a cumulative assessment of traffic. Um, but for others, smaller ones that fall under that threshold, the impact um, that's reported is not a cumulative of everything that's been approved by council. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to ask the really fun question now of like, how much work is it for staff to do to provide cumulative uh, reports, e even if they are 
let me rephrase. What would it take for staff to do cumulative reports for everything that is proposed, um, even if they are considered tentative numbers as they are proposed and not necessarily approved developments? Um, Grace Smith here. I'll take the, the schools and the water and sewer, and I'll let Arlene speak to transportation because I know that um, we've met a lot recently with trans transportation and we've been talking through that very um, that very issue. And so she probably has more recent information than I do. Um, with schools, we're working with DPS now uh, through the comp plan process and, and outside of the comp plan process to try to, um, I think Alexander mentioned this earlier, try to clarify and shore up those numbers. And, and we really rely on um, their methodology and the data that they have because they're the ones that have all of the um, information on the students, not, not our department. So that's something we're working through now. Um, I can't really answer when and how we do that because um, we're talk in talks with them now. And uh, as far as water and sewer, again, we do not calculate um, the water and sewer um, information. We have a water management department that does that. We can go back to them and ask them if they're able to uh, provide that kind of data for the purposes of um, these types of cases. And it might even be that's something they're, they're working on now and I just don't know it. Uh, we're in talks with them too about capacity for future, obviously through the comp plan process. But um, those are good questions and um, we can get back with the commission on the first two. I'll let Erling take the third one if that's okay. Yes, thank you. Erling Thomas, transportation. Um, so for developments that um, don't require a traffic study. Um, a cumulative assessment can be done. Um, there would need to be some assumptions made, you know, regarding distribution of traffic and direction that folks are traveling. Um, and obviously, as they spread out on the roads, um, traffic is a little more dispersed. Um, but potentially, you could set a baseline for, you know, what when developments were approved and move forward with from there making some assumptions. Um, but I think it's also a good thing to remember though that we don't necessarily reserve capacity, I guess per se, along roadways, you know, because of projects approved doesn't necessarily mean that it will um, be implemented. Um, so those those are some of the things to consider. Thank you all for that. Um, so to reflect what I heard, um, to some level, we're working on improving our um, impact assessments, which is good to hear. Um, but also there's a lot of other departments involved, so this doesn't fall fully on planning. There's a lot of coordination happening here. And um, there's some, still some complications because it's hard to say, oh, this development got approved, so it's definitely gonna happen, so let's build a road for it like that would be that would be poor planning in my opinion because um, we we need to know that the development's going to occur and it is it is true that there are rezonings that happen and get approved and they do not move forward for construction there is one there's i still drive by a rezoning sign right next to my apartment complex that's been sitting there for a year or two now that was approved by city council and it's just sitting there the trees are still up thankfully but um, so I think that's something just to note on some of these cases. Um, I know that in some ways the answers that we get on our impact assessments can be unsatisfactory because it is hard to predict the future. Um, but I do have faith that our impact assessments are doing the best that we can to get a good, uh, to get a good estimate of what is going on. Uh, Grace, did you have any other comments you wanted to add? I do. I have actually, I wanted to uh, just say, please, when you have a moment, let me know where that sign is so we can pick it up. <laughs> and um, so it doesn't become road, like roadside litter. Um, and the other thing is, um, yes, the, the, as far as the, the, the cases that sometimes just don't happen, that, that does happen. We see that. And sometimes they come back to you for changes. So um, yes, we will, we will work hard with our, um, with our fellow departments. But I also want to say that we have seen situations and instances. Um, there are some cases that have not made it to your, um, your body. They've actually been withdrawn after submission 
because they didn't do their due diligence on the front end and they found out because our water and um, water management department was very clear that there was not capacity and we could not serve that project. Not now and not in five years. So um, I just wanted to, to make sure that, you know, that it doesn't happen a lot, but it does. And so it's, it's not like everybody's getting through. They're not getting through the gate. So thanks. Thank you, Grace. That's very helpful context. Um, so because I work a lot in housing, um, I, I don't know, I enjoy talking about it, but also it's, uh, it can be a hard thing to talk about. And I also have um, had to do research on the housing market in the triangle. And Mr. Ghosh referenced that nationally, construction costs have increased by about 30%. Um, and it was, um, I guess, ironic that that was the number that he described because the number I've seen for the triangle in terms of housing price growth since the beginning of 2021 is 30%. And so just to be clear about what that means, a 30% increase on a townhome that is $250,000 means that it's now selling at approximately $325,000. A single family house that sold at $290,000 in 2021 would now sell at about $377,000 based on that 30% price increase we have seen across the region. That also is not accounting for the fact that many units, many houses are being sold anywhere from twenty dollars to $50,000 over asking price, meaning that on those rough estimates, it is possible that these townhomes end up selling between three hundred and twenty dollars and $370,000, and the single family houses are selling between three hundred and seventy dollars and $420,000. That's not unreasonable. And I don't want to say this to slam the applicant. There are a lot of, you know, valid complaints about this application that have been stated. I say this to kind of just reflect and hold a mirror up of what a starter home now may cost in our market. And um, the sad thing about it is that I haven't gotten a 30% raise in the past year. And I assume most people on this call have not gotten a 30% raise in the past year. Um, and I think one thing I have been considering with these cases is that we need more rental units in our market because they are available at lower price points and you are able to provide lower price points and that affordable home ownership is becoming harder and harder to achieve by developers, by for-profit developers. And if we are going to achieve affordable home ownership, we do need massive subsidy, massive funding from our local government and from the state government and the federal government to make that happen. That does not mean that I'm not going to continue to push for applicants to uh, include affordable for sale housing in their proposals. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that the market has shifted in an ex extreme way that is making it increasingly difficult to achieve affordability without some kind of government funding. Um, with that said, I'm disappointed, as Mr. Commissioner Cutright and Commissioner Zuri Williams mentioned, that there was no seemingly no consideration of um, finding a way to even minorly contribute to affordable housing and housing affordability on this project. Um, I love Commissioner Cutright's idea of donating lots to nonprofits and to the community land trust. Like we need to be getting creative. And I, um, I just, I, you know, it never quite clicks in my brain why we can't move a few homes a little bit closer together and free up a few extra lots to donate to somebody. Like it's it, in my brain, it doesn't seem that hard. It seems more like a choice. And um, I hope that things start changing and we make different choices moving forward. And 
I hope that with the new comprehensive plan, we set better standards moving ahead. Um, but I just wanted to highlight what we're talking about when we're talking about the market shifting and the price increase. It's it's significant. Um, personally speaking, like I'm not purchasing a house right now because of how the market has shifted. I mean, I know that many families have likely faced the same thing, particularly young families who probably have student debt. And um, there are a lot of factors at play here, but um, I think it's important that we are specific when talking about what the market increases mean. Um, with that, um, Mr. Ghosh, you had mentioned the possibility of identifying a minimum number of single family houses on this site. Have you and your client been able to discuss that? Yeah, we, we could add a commitment that there'd be a minimum of 50 single family homes. So that condition would read just like the other condition on townhomes. Great, thank you. Um, Brooke, Alexander, do you all do you all need anything else on that front? No, there is an a, an additional proffer um, that was made earlier uh, by the applicant uh, to work with staff for the reconsideration of the Greenway easement location um, to either be offset from the stream buffer or in a potentially different location. Is the second proffer that I heard. Um, Mr. Ghosh, can you just confirm that? Uh, yeah, in the area west of the Northern Durham Parkway uh, right of way reservation. Just, just to put a you know boundary on it, I suppose. Um, if there are no further comments or questions at this time, I would accept a motion, um, including the two additional proffers. Mr. Chair, I'd uh, like to make a motion that we take case number Z21-00012 with the uh, modify additional proffers that have been stated to be forwarded to the City Council for a favorable recommendation. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Moved by Commissioner Morgan seconded by Commissioner Cameron. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, may we have the roll call? Sure. Amendolia? No. Baker? No. Busby? No. Cameron? No. Cut right. Commissioner Cutright. Oh, I'm sorry. I think you're on mute. No, no. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Um, uh, Commissioner Lowe. No. MacGyver. No. Morgan. No. Cease. No. Carmen Williams. No. And Zuri Williams. No. Okay, motion fills 011. Thank you all. Um, thanks to staff, thanks to the applicant and all the residents that showed up. Um, I do wanna briefly acknowledge Rachel Gage. I see they had their hand raised. Um, I wanna make sure they have a question that can answer that. Rachel. Uh, Rachel, if you're speaking, we are unable to hear you. I've dropped out, if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you now. <clears throat> yes, um, I'm on the board of directors with Rachel. Um, in question to property uh, Z21-00034. Um, um, uh, 
I'm sorry, um, that case is the fourth on our agenda tonight. Okay. There will be time to speak on that okay, uh, when we get what... to that case. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we are going to move now to case Z21-00021, Dearborn Drive Multifamily, and we'll begin with the staff report. Okay, good evening all. Alexander Cahill here with the City County Planning Department. Uh, commissioners, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, I'll be presenting on case Z21-00021, Dearborn Drive Multifamily. Uh, we received an application from Alexander. Landon. Um, yes. I cannot see your screen. Oh, awesome. Well, let's try this again. How's that? That's great. <laughs> All right. This uh, is for Z21-00021, Dearborn Drive Multifamily. Uh, we received an application from Landon Cox of LDG Development. Um, for a rezoning proposal to build 182 affordable multifamily units with up to 5,000 square feet of community service and civic space. This is in the urban tier and is located within the geographic boundary of the Brighttown community. The existing zoning is residential urban five and the applicant is proposing to rezone to a planned development residential 19.401 rezoning designation. The existing flum is medium density residential and the applicant, uh, this the inconsistent zoning will change to medium high density residential if the zoning were approved. This is at the Southeast quadrant of the intersection of Old Oxford Road and Dearborn Drive. And it is within the Falls of News Jordan Lake protection, uh, watershed protection overlay. You can see uh, the proposal in the middle of the map here Residential Urban 5 uh, abuts the property to the east, south, and west. Um, and then Residential Suburban Multifamily, Residential Suburban 20, and Residential Urban 5 and Commercial Neighborhood abut the property to the northwest and north. The site is considered an urban infill site. Um, there is development um, ensconced or surrounding the entire development site. The site is also the existing Veterans of Foreign Wars VFW site um, with uh, associated uh, unmaintained gravel and parking right now. This proposal has um, a significant contribution to our housing units in Durham with 100% of the units being defined as affordable per the ordinance. There's also a community service space up to 5,000 square feet um, that the applicant will speak a little bit more on this, but they will be uh, having the Brighton Community Associ Association be able to use that space for community meetings. Uh, a gated entrance and perimeter fence are also included in this proposal. Dedication of right of way, construction of turn lanes, additional asphalt for bicycle lanes in coordination with Go Durham and Go Triangle on a second bus shelter pad are also commitments on this proposal. And then in terms of the design, a clubhouse and patios or balconies will be included for the uh, affordable units. The existing site does have some environmental features. Uh, there is an intermittent stream on the southwest part of the site that has a hundred foot that will have a hundred foot stream buffer, and there is a, a perennial stream on the southeast portion of the site that will have a hundred foot stream buffer as well. There is uh, existing gravel and impervious surface that the applicant has committed to removing. Uh, this proposal does, uh, again, is for 182 units uh, with parking um, and clubhouse and amenities and civic space. A neighborhood meeting was held in accordance with UDO requirements on May 20th. Uh, eight community members were in attendance. Eight social pinpoint comments were received for the, by staff in relation to this case. And then in addition, the uh, developer, Landon Cox, and his applicant team have actually worked very closely with the Brighton Community Association, Vanessa Mesa Evans, and her development sub team to incorporate feedback into the proposal, which I'm sure they'll be uh, discussing tonight in their presentation. Uh, as said, staff does determine that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan, including the future land use and other adopted ordinances and plans. Uh, staff conclude that the development team did work closely with the Brighton Community Association uh, with the VFW site 
um, an organization and work to incorporate community feedback throughout the, this proposed rezoning to make the project uh, stronger. Uh, thank you for your time. The applicants uh, and staff are here for any questions. Thank you, Alexander. At this time, we will open the public hearing. We'll begin with the applicant presentation. Um, I know Mr. Ghosh is on this case as well. And I believe we also have Kelsey Westwood and Landon Cox as part of the applicant team. Mr. Ghosh, you'll have 10 minutes to give your comments. Uh, thank you and good evening again. I still am Neil Ghosh at the Morningstar Law Group. This time I'm representing LDG. Uh, Landon Cox from LDG is on the call with me as well as Kelsey Westwood from Kimley Horn. First of all, uh, I cannot thank Mr. Cahill enough for his guidance on this project. He has been involved with this one from the very early stages. He has attended several meetings with neighbors and the VCA and has been a great facilitator throughout the process. So uh, Mr. Cahill, I wanna say thank you for that. You really have gone above and beyond the call of duty. Um, I think a good place to start with this project is the story. This site is the base for the local veterans of Fort Morris chapter. The base commander, Larry Coleman, uh, recognized some time ago that the site was becoming a burden for the VFW to maintain on account of its shrinking membership. It's quite a large building. I don't know if you've been out to it before. So um, he set out to find a solution to this problem. I believe originally he met with elected officials and city staff uh, to discuss the possibility of using the site to build like tiny homes for veteran housing or something like that. Anyway, over the course of his conversations, he determined that the site needed to be developed for affordable housing to meet the needs of Durham and the Bracktown community. So in steps LDG. LDG is one of the leading developers of affordable housing in the nation. They are based out of Kentucky, but they also have communities in Tennessee, Texas, Georgia, Virginia, um, and their first community in North Carolina is in Raleigh, this project will be their second in North Carolina. LDG's track record of success is built upon a commitment to understanding community needs and innovative thinking to address those needs. For example, this is the first PDR I have worked on, which includes a civic space component. This 5,000 square foot civic space was included in this project to provide a permanent home for the local VFW so that it can continue carrying out its local, uh, its, its important work. And I think that shows some a very imaginative thinking on behalf of LDG. Um, and they're doing this on a project that commits to an average rental rate that is affordable at the 60% AMI level for a period of 30 years. This project is modeled based on the 4% uh, LIHTC program, which is what they intend to utilize here. So ultimately, this project will provide affordable housing and I guess you call it affordable space for the VFW. Now, Alexander mentioned, or I should say Mr. Cahill mentioned that we have had several conversations with BCA area residents um, about hopes, desires, and, and you know, what their expectations are for what would occur at this property. Some of those items were not able to put into a zoning commitment, um, but we have agreed to and, and are in the process of entering into a memorandum of understanding with the BCA and also with the BFW. Um, one of those desires was for the BCA, Brackdown Community Association, to have some space to have, you know, office space essentially for meetings, the administrative function. And that is something that the BFW has indicated its willingness to provide within the civic space in this community. Um, there are other items that, that would be, you know, incorporated into that memorandum of understanding. Uh, and that is in Larchford base, not in Larchford, is, is driven by the discussions and desires of the BCA and neighbors. So, you know, we're, we're, we've worked very hard to build rapport with the Bracken community and uh, continue to do so. I think this project really shows uh, what is possible in Durham if you, if you put your mind to it and, you know, have a willingness to do so. We're eager to get your feedback on this and we hope to have your support. Um, again, our team is available to answer any questions you may have. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Okay, we have 
one person who signed up in advance to speak, um, Mimi Kessler. Um, I'll go ahead and say if there are other folks hoping to speak on this item, please go ahead and raise your hand so we can start queuing you up. Um, but Mimi, we will begin with you. You'll have two minutes to make your comments. My name is Mimi Kessler. I live at 1418 Woodland Drive in Durham. Um, I would like very much to hear what the uh, Bragtown community uh, wants to say about the engagement. And um, it, it sounds like the developer has tried very hard to work with them, but um, I would feel better about uh, knowing um, what they have to say. Um, and I, I uh, renew my uh, concerns about the water and sewer. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be annoying. Um, but when um, uh, Mr. Cahill, I think, said that the water um, evaluation is done um, as the as new homes are connected, and we know there's a lag between this stage and them even breaking ground, never mind connecting, I, I renew my concern about the water and sewer. But I, I do hope that um, that the Bragtown community is in favor of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. I see Larry Coleman has their hand raised. Um, Larry, you'll have two minutes to make comment. Please state your name and address and make your comments. Hello, I'm Larry Coleman. I'm actually the commander of the Durham VFW located there and the current property owner. Uh, just to elaborate, elaborate on what Neil stated, uh, I was the VFW myself was involved before LDG came on the scene. It was uh, summer of 2019 uh, that I first decided with the post membership that we could do more for the Bragtown community with this post. Uh, the VFW has owned the property since about 1964, built the facility uh, in the early 1970s. And as uh, Neil said, it's about a 10,000 square foot facility and really doesn't make the vision of what the VFW is anymore. We're turning into a more service-oriented, outreach, community-based organization rather than bringing folks in to do bingo and dances. Um, at that time in 2019, as Neil stated, I was looking at Tiny Homes Community. Uh, at that time, uh, I think in September, there was probably 15 to 20 individuals from the city and county planning. Um, I had the also... Uh, just different individuals from both city county. Also Mayor Shule at the time was there. Um, and when I did my presentation on tithing homes, Karen Lato quickly brought me up to speed on the inefficiency of them. And then the meeting ended with Mayor Shule recommending directive action for me to consider affordable homes for this program. Um, we went to the sale, the first one fell through, LDG came in, they did a site visit. They heard about the story, then they offered to give us 5,000 square foot facility uh, in conjunction with the clubhouse. To speak to the community center, uh, I have been in close coordination with the Bragtown Community Association. They're excited about the community space that they will have access to on a permanent basis. Um, and we are committed at the VFW, we're building flexible space so that we'll be available to the community at large, uh, not just those tenant organizations. We already have, um, support and a commitment from the Durham VA and the, the VA Region 6 director to put staff in this facility um, for the veteran population. But I want to stress, this is not only a veterans population center, we will also serve the local community um, as allowable, as space is available, but we're not gonna put, when we, it's too soon to be designed, but I know you've all seen business co-op space, um, flexible use space. That is gonna be the design of this facility. Uh, I've been working with a working group that meets about every six weeks that include VCA, other veteran communities. It's a group of about 10 to 12 people where we focus on the 5,000 square foot facility that will be owned by the VFW. Um, I can answer any questions related to that, share that information and that vision later because we do have a draft business plan, but um, just appreciate you giving me time to speak. I think this is a great opportunity for Bragtown. Uh, that space, the VFW owns about, well, 
we have seven acres of, I think, about the 11 acres of the area over there, and it's being underutilized right now. So I'll be able to answer any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Larry. Um, and I, I would just know I did allow um, more than two minutes there because that felt like very important context um, and worth taking extra time. Um, I see no one else with their hand raised at this time. Um, to Mr. Ghosh, I'll have about four to five minutes left of your time. Um, I wanted to provide y'all any opportunity to respond to any comments or questions y'all heard. Uh, thank you. I mean, I, I don't know that there is anything to respond to, but I am happy to uh, answer any questions um, that you all may have. Great. With that, um, I will go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, and we'll start with commissioner questions and comments. Commissioner Cease. Thank you. I, I have a question about an image that is missing from the um, materials included from uh, in attachment H bicycle and pad advisory committee comments. The last page, I think, or at least item eight in there referenced some requested additional sidewalks and there's discussion in the comments, but that image doesn't appear and I, I can't seem to uh, see it on the online link either. Does staff know where those requested sidewalks were located or is that an image that's available? Yes, I can pull the image up and I, I apologize for that. Uh, something happened when it was submitted and disappeared. Um, I'll pull it up so we're not talking in the ether. Okay, well, while you're while you're pulling that up, let me also just ask a, a question. Maybe this is for Neil. The text commitment number seven, no site plan for new development shall be approved without provision for gated or otherwise secured vehicular access to the site. Is the intention... Um, for the entire perimeter of the site to be secured or fenced? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yes, the this particular commitment was added after we had um, a very well attended, um, I, I would say, event engagement session at the VFW. It was it was. The majority of people who attended that um, that particular event were from uh, the community just across the street, and one of the concerns that they had, which which was news to us, uh, was that you know they face they don't let their kids play outside because people drive through the neighborhood and the neighborhood gets shot up on a regular basis. In fact, the base commander Larry Coleman. Um, told us a story about when he was outside in the parking lot of the BFW and that very thing happened across the way. And so one of the common things, I mean, actually the most common thing we heard from folks in that community was that this place needs to be gated so that their kids can play outside. So we added that commitment, um, you know, to address that concern, a very serious concern, obviously. Sure. So, and, um, Following up on that, then, are the sole access points for pedestrians to be aligned with the two side access points? Is that the intention? Um, I, be I believe there are access points. So vehicular access is limited, but there would be access points, maybe a gate in, in the fence to allow for pedestrian access through the site to get out towards, uh, well, to get out to the sidewalk on the on the road. Let me rephrase that. Are those pedestrian gates aligned with where the bus shelters are to be located? So, okay, so there's already an existing bus shelter on, um, on Dearborn. So there will be pedestrian access directly to that. We have a proffer where we would add another bus shelter. However, and it will be in conjunction with Go Triangle right. uh, and Go Durham. But you know we've offered to put that bus shelter on either uh, Dearborn or on Old Oxford, as they you know as they tell us what the need is. Um, you know our understanding is the one on Dearborn is used pretty well, so there is possibility 
that they actually would want to you know, increase that shelter rather than add a stop on Old Oxford. So we're open to that. I couldn't tell you though exactly where the other bus stop may go. So I can't answer your question completely. I think it's but important. The idea is to have access to the bus shelter. Yeah. But I think it's important for that to be considered and that um, not just considered, but encouraged that there be a, a clear accommodation of the pedestrian access to the bus shelter locations, wherever they end up being. Yeah. Um, and uh, in order for those to really be viable. Uh, and I and I understand the security concern, but I think those those all have to be collectively considered um, and probably beyond what we could incorporate now. But I would not want the text commitment as it's written to preclude that from occurring. And I don't think that it does. Um, and I guess related to that, uh, and in, in some way the security concerns uh, address the question, but I'm not sure they address it fully, especially given that the Bragtown Community Association may have um, or would have presumably uh, the opportunity to use some of the civic space as proposed. Mm -hmm. The reference to Allgood Street, the dedication of the right of way and the completion of that, there's an indication there or a request from the PED bike committee, I believe it is, bike and PED advisory committee to allow either a vehicular or pedestrian connection to that. And the response is that the, that connection would be impacted by the stream buffer or the riparian buffer, um, which is not fully accurate in that the building footprint that's allowed on the development plan has at least 50 feet, 60 feet or so of frontage onto that cul-de-sac. Now, and it's future cul-de-sac. It would seem from a planning perspective, and I recognize there's the security concerns that uh, you know, several blocks of residential to the south here may have a need to access the community space in this future project and that either a direct pedestrian connection could be made or a pedestrian link along the southwestern perimeter from Allgood up to Old Oxford would be a way to ensure that security of the site, a secure perimeter of the site is maintained, but that there's an improved access um, to the site, both for this neighborhood and to those bus shelters um, and transit service on old, old Oxford. And I think that that move, that pedestrian linkage, you know, essentially in parallel to the Southwestern perimeter of the site going from old Oxford to all good would be consistent with the spirit of the connectivity requirements that are addressed kind of in our ordinance today and contemplated in all the comprehensive planning goals. Um, so I'll just cue that up and let others run with that. If you, if you would like, um, but I think it's important. It's an important consideration. Thank you. You commissioner sees other questions and comments. Commissioner Busby. Thanks chairman. Doyle. I, you know, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, Mimi Kessler took the time to speak and I, I appreciate it. And I, I, I can't say this for certain, but my, my strong suspicion in terms of the Bragtown community, they have been very active and engaged. Uh, we have heard from them on other issues, especially when there've been concerns, but also when they've been able to support an issue. Uh, I trust that they, we hear, we have heard that they have been actively engaged in the process, and I am very confident that if they were feeling like this was a proposal that was not representing their perspective, we would be hearing from them. But I did just want to ask, invite the staff to let us know about what they understand the Bragtown Community Association's involvement has been, uh, or if there's anyone in attendance tonight, I didn't recognize any of the leadership from the Bragtown Community Association on the Zoom, but would welcome anyone just sharing their perspective just so we can proactively hear from folks. But uh, I know they put in a ton of time, so I didn't, I didn't necessarily expect them to be here this evening. They have been very active and engaged for quite a long time, and I really appreciate what they've done. But 
Uh, if nothing else, Alexander, maybe you can just give us a quick update because I think that's a really important question that we need to understand. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Busby. Alexander, oh, I'm going to jump in um, there yeah. as well. Um, I appreciate that, Commissioner Busby. And I was going to, um, I should have started with this, but um, I did speak to a representative of the Braggtown Community Association this morning. Um, and we talked through some of the outstanding things that they are hoping to get out of this application. Um, and I intend on bringing any of those items that aren't addressed um, before it comes to me up when it is when I take my turn. Um, and I asked very explicitly, like, hey, how did y'all feel about the engagement? Did you feel like the developers were treating y'all with respect and everything? And it was an overwhelming yes. Um, they felt like the applicant has been working with them and um, while they have uh, more requests and things that they would like to see this case provide, um, I, based on my conversation with them, I got the sense that they felt comfortable with what was happening. They're thankful for the affordable housing um, and they need more than just housing. They need other things as well, like community space, infrastructure, et cetera, community safety, all of the above. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps address your question. And Alexander, if you want to add any specifics on number of meetings and things like that, please feel free to. Yeah, and, and I won't speak to what the applicant has done other than, you know, our conversations with Pride Town leadership is that they, so what Austin just said um, is that they've been very engaged and they've tried to work with them and they've adapted their project based on feedback. Um, we have a monthly, or we have had up until recently, a monthly working group with the Bragtown's Development Subcommittee. Um, so they have direct access to proposals and projects. Um, there were a few outstanding things on this proposal that they still would like to see, even though they're in general support of it, uh, because of the housing and civic spaces Austin mentioned in this. Uh, they were hoping for more units committed at a 30% AMI. Um, however, um, because there is no gap financing or uh, as of yet procured, um, there's, that's not able to be committed to, uh, but hoping that in future um, sessions where the applicant is trying to get those credits, they'll be able to commit to further 30% AMI units and a percentage of those. That was one of the big outstanding things uh, that they really wanted to see addressed still. Um, everything else was more uh, not development plan related um, from staff's perspective. Um, but we we continue to be uh, in conversation with them as we move forward. Thank you. That, that's great. Now, Alexander, I just think kudos to you and the whole staff for the ongoing engagement with the Braggtown Community Association and other neighborhoods as well. You know it's critical, and I, I think it it is paying off with active and engaged communities, especially in Braggtown. And, and Chair Mandelia, thanks for that update. I, I may reserve any additional comments, but I actually want to wait and I want to hear the, the concerns that you raise on behalf of the Braggtown Community Association. So I that's it for me for the moment. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead and do that. Um, so first, I do want to ask the applicant, are you, you, are you applying for gap financing from the city to try and get more units at 30%? We did uh, apply for gap financing and we're not one of the finalists. Okay, um, that is helpful information. Um, so you're using the LIHTC program and I'm assuming because it's a 2022 application, you are using the updated LIHTC rents. Yes, reserving. I think that's accurate. Okay, so I do wanna take a moment to just like be very specific about what 60% um, AMI now means um, under this program um, because of the increases in rents and prices and to a lesser extent incomes, which is debatable. Um, the new 2022 rents for 60% AMI means that a one bedroom unit under the LIHTC program can be no more than $1,074 for two bedrooms, it can be no more than $1,290 and a three bedroom, it can be no more than $1,490. So I just wanted to highlight that to provide context on what these rents actually mean. 
Um, so I think one high level question that could address all of the concerns that that the Bragton Community Association noted to me is we have seen in the past uh, proffers for an applicant to establish some sort of community advisory group um, or um, establish some kind of ongoing conversations with residents. Um, and I, I think that could go a long way to providing more collaboration on some of the specific items. And I'm curious if, um, Nil, your team has considered that or if you would consider that. Yeah, so um, we've heard of that, and uh, but that was in the context of the MOU, which Memorandum of Understanding, uh, which you know we took to be outside of the scope of, of the zoning um, and not necessarily tied directly to the zoning of the, of the property, we think that's appropriate given that it would be an agreement between you know specific parties as opposed to a general um, you know, condition of the property. Um, so yeah, that is something that we have heard. And, and as I said, we are open to you and, and have begun discussions about a memorandum of understanding. Okay, and so under that, just to reflect that, under that memorandum of understanding, um, there will be guidelines or requirements on continued engagement with Bragtown Community Association? Well, okay, Austin, it, uh, or Chair Amendola, it hasn't been written. It, we don't have any issue with that, but I, I don't want to tell you what, okay. you know, going to be in a document that hasn't been written. We expect that there'll be more engagement with the BCA, if, if that's what you're asking. And, and we also expect that the MOU would be probably a three-party agreement between, you know, us, LDG, um, the VFW, and the BCA, because it's a, you know, it's a joint effort here. Okay. Um, that's somewhat helpful. I would uh, prefer more assurance that that is definitely going to happen or is already in draft form or something like that, but um, I hear and trust that you are working on that and trying to identify language to um, codify in the MOU that there will be continued engagement. Um, so looking at specific issues, um, one of them was already mentioned with, I think Mr. Goshun mentioned this with the bus shelter, that y'all have already proffered to construct an additional bu uh, bus shelter if it is necessary on Old Oxford Road, and you had already referenced that there's a desire from Bragtown to have the bus shelter on Dearborn to be basically improved. Um, and I heard, I think I heard you say like an either or, like from your perspective, it would be you could do one or the other. And I'm curious, like, is it possible to do both? And I know that, you know, there's Go Triangle and Go Durham is involved in this, but um, given right. that we're seeing increased transit ridership in this area and uh, that bus shelter is in a pretty exposed area in terms of not a lot of shade. I think it would be worth having that improved. I'm curious if that is something y'all considered adding as a proper. So, well, okay, we haven't considered adding that specific as a proper. When we make proffers related, when I say we, I mean on rezoning cases when there are proffers made about like transit improvements, particularly for, for bus routes. They have to be couched in the desire for Go Triangle, Go Durham to have those things. So the proffer we've made is written as an either or, um, meaning we would provide a, a, essentially additional stop on either Dearborn or Old Oxford. We don't know that Old, we don't know what Go Durham or Go, Go Triangle are going to want. Um, actually, I think there is a strong possibility that they may want, you know, the additional bus stop on Dearborn, because my understanding is that that stop is used um, a lot and maybe could use some more space. I think your question is, would we provide more space at that one and provide um, a bus stop on Old Oxford? 
And yes. I mean, I would say, I think we're open to that. That's, that is not what the commitment says right now. And I'm not sure how we would word that. I, I think we could couch that as doing both subject to go Durham, go triangle approval or something like that. Yeah. Um, the language I understand could be complicated. It seems like there could be a phrase added um, or both like or both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Sure. Um, Erlene, I saw you had your raised hand. Did you want to make a comment um, or shed any light on this? Erlene Thomas, transportation. No, I just wanted to comment that the the bus stop on the existing bus stop on Dearborn has recently been improved uh, improved by Go Triangle and Go Durham. So I just wanted to clarify that, but. Um, we do need to revise the commitment if you would, if they would like to um, possibly do improvements at, the, okay. at both sides. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Ghosh, are you saying you will consider that? Are you saying that you will, um, would like to add the proffer or what? to have the, or both language in there? Uh, Chair Amendolia, do you have additional questions? I'm asking if I can get back to you on this or do you need? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I do have additional questions and we're about to have to take a quick recess. Okay. Um, Actually, yeah. So if we can get that recess, I can call the client. We can talk. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to spew out the different, the list of things. So uh, if you have a piece of paper in front of you, sure. just, then you can have the next 10 minutes to talk about it. Okay. Um, so the other things that came up were uh, open space on the site, just wanting some clarity on what that will be. Um, we often get language on like, there will be a dog park or uh, a playground or something, like some just providing some color on what might be in open space on the site. Um, I'm sure you've discussed with Bragtown ensuring that there is a sufficient number of ADA units on site um, and I, I kind of want to, I want to talk about that on, in terms of what is required based on the live tech program and what you can do to kind of go above and beyond to ensure that particularly folks who are aging can age in place at this site. Um, and then the third thing is, um, I, uh, when I talked to the, um, folks at Bracktown, there was, I think some uncertainty of the community service building and what that's going to look like and any commitments around that. And I'm a little sparse in some of the details there. Um, so I want to just, I want to be clear, and this one might not be as much of a proffer or land use thing, but just understanding like, I, I know the existing building, it looks like it's set to be torn down based on the development plan. And so I'm curious um, about the details there and particularly in terms of ensuring that the space, like how you will be ensuring that the space is going to provide services for the community. Um, I think that was the primary concern is getting that assurance, which I believe is through the MOU, but um, I would like to just take the time for you to kind of walk me through that. Um, the only other thing that I would ask you to think about and um, to speak to in a moment is how to make this space, um, make this space so that it is working both during the daytime and the nighttime. Um, it was um, when I spoke to Town, they raised a really good point of the fact that sometimes we develop things based on how they look during the daytime because that's when we're typically doing work in construction. And so like, that's where our brains go, but also thinking about like, what does this look like at night in terms of efficient lighting that, you know, is creating a safe environment, but not like creating light pollution, those types of questions. And what does sidewalk connectivity and pedestrian safety look like when we're thinking of it both during the day and at night? Um, so we'd love to hear comments on that. Do you have any clarifying questions or points on that before we go to recess? Uh, no, I think I, if I could just 
touch on these when we get back. I think that would be best. Great. We're going to take a 10 minute recess at this time to give our closed captioners um, a break. We will return at 7.43 p.m. Have you experienced changes in Durham that negatively affect your everyday life? Many in the community have. The city and county of Durham want to correct those issues and ensure the future changes work for the entire community. They are listening and want to hear your ideas for making Durham a place where everyone thrives. That's why the city and county of Durham are inviting all members of the Durham community to take part in the creation of the new comprehensive plan, which will determine the vision for growing Durham over the next 30 years. This collaboration between the city and county of Durham and the Durham community is the result of the new Engage Durham initiative, which seeks to ensure that all community stakeholders are involved in the shaping of city and county projects. Help build a Durham that works for everyone. We, the people. Nosotros, the gente. Women, Renmin. Mia Dumavio. Hum Sablog. We, the people, hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal and shall be afforded the inalienable right to fair housing. The city of Durham and HUD are committed to ensuring that everyone is treated equitably when searching for a place to call home. Did you know the city of Durham has interpretation and translation services available? The city adopted a language access plan to provide language services and help non-English speakers have access to city services and programs without a language barrier. Through the city's language access plan, residents have the right to request interpretation and translation services free of charge, receive translation of vital documents and emergency communications in Spanish, and submit complaints of language discrimination or on the failure to adequately provide services in accordance with the city's language access plan policy. For more information on the city's language access efforts, visit durhamnc.gov slash language access. ¿Sabía que la ciudad de Durham cuenta con servicios de interpretación y traducción? La ciudad adoptó un plan de acceso al idioma para ofrecer servicios lingüísticos y ayudar a que las personas que no hablan inglés puedan tener acceso a los servicios y programas de la ciudad sin la barrera del idioma. Por medio del plan de acceso al idioma, los habitantes tienen derecho a solicitar sin costo alguno servicios de interpretación y traducción, recibir la traducción de documentos importantes y de comunicaciones de emergencia en español, presentar una denuncia de discriminación por motivos de idioma o por no recibir servicios de manera adecuada de acuerdo con la política del plan de acceso al idioma de la ciudad. Para recibir más información sobre la labor de la ciudad relacionada con el acceso al idioma, visita durhamnc.gov diagonal acceso. I was looking for an opportunity and uh, an old friend of mine suggested that I apply at Go Durham. The community really relies on us on Go Durham Public Transportation. Well, I like driving a bus because of the friendly culture. I love it in the morning when people greet me. Good morning. They give me a friendly wave. They appreciate you. And that goes a long way being a bus driver in Go Durham. Anything can be achieved here. Um, you can come in at the bottom and you will be able to excel in a fairly short amount of time. Here, I started as an operator and I'm here now as an operator training specialist. So as long as you stick to it, you can excel. The perfect candidate that would excel at Go Durham is someone with tenacity, someone with drive, someone who wants to make a difference for their community. You have to be people oriented, you have to be experienced, and you have to be on hands, ready to go, but with the proper training, it's just like driving a car. So as a new driver with road training, come in and you see me and I'm gonna make sure you have all the tools to succeed. They give you a lot of input and they work with you step by step. So you won't be alone in this. To anyone considering working for Go Durham, you won't regret it. 
please come, please apply. We would love to have you join the Go Durham team. My name is Dwayne McIntyre, and I'm a dispatcher at the Durham Emergency Communication Center. The best thing about being a dispatcher at the Durham Emergency Communication Center is truly being able to make a difference. Sometimes you don't realize how much of a difference you're making. Um, however, being able to hear feedback from when people call to say thank you, that you may have saved their relative life or was able to calm them down, really makes it worthwhile being a dispatcher. One day I received a call from a man. He was trapped inside of his home. There was a lot of smoke. He was really struggling to be able to see and get out. He was able to tell me where he was inside of his home. I was able to relay that information to the firefighters and they were able to get him out safely. My job is satisfying because at times I do go home tired but I don't go home ever feeling like I didn't help anyone that day. There's always someone that's calling in that's in distress, that just may need someone they talk to, or just may need some type of emergency, emergency assistance. But every day I go home to feel with the knowledge that I've helped someone that day. My younger sister was someone that never got involved with bad people. She was a selfless person, and her life was taken away by her boyfriend due to gun violence in front of her three younger kids. I was in my car. I heard loud gunfire. Didn't know where I got shot was dramatic, and experience I couldn't, you know, want anybody to live through. Gun violence can happen any given time, anywhere. I'm truly blessed to be alive today. The person that did this to my sister is still on the loose, and we were justice for my sister and for my nephews. We don't want for this to happen to another woman out there. Don't stay quiet, don't be afraid. To talk. I like being there for people. I like when my investigators and I go out there that we're out there with a specific purpose and that's to try to bring somebody to justice on behalf of a citizen to get a violent criminal off the streets. I'm born and raised in Durham. I still have family members here, uh, classmates, friends. It's personal for me. We see on the news constantly the numbers of shootings is in the hundreds. Um, last year is pushing a thousand. So you would think that around every corner there's somebody with a gun ready to shoot. But through our investigations, we've learned that the percentage of the population that's committing all these shootings is very low compared to the number of shootings we're actually happening. Members of the community can help make it safer. If they'd seen something in their neighborhood, please call us, let us know. There are creative ways to be able to, to solve crimes, and that's through anonymous information through avenues such as Crime Stoppers. Getting that information in the, in the hands of police and investigators, it's, it's critical because a lot of stuff, we can have ideas of what happened, but if we can't prove it in court, justice isn't going to be served. Just give us the information to help point us in the right direction.
Okay, we are going to be again returning from our recess. Once we get um, a quorum of commissioners back on, uh, Mr. Ghosh, you may have your time to respond. Sure. I right, suppose so just let me know when that is. I know. Yes, we'll do. Start then. Okay, Mr. Ghosh, you may go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, so before the break, you had listed off a few items mm -hmm. um, and I had an opportunity to speak with my client about them. So I wanted to get back to you on those. Uh, first was the about the bus stop. Currently our um, condition related to that, which is I think condition 6.3, it reads subject to determination by Go Durham and Go Triangle on the need for transit related improvements at the time of site plan submittal, uh, construct a concrete pad bus shelter to Go Durham Go Triangle specifications along the east side of Old Oxford Road or along the south side of Dearborn Drive adjacent to the site. And if it's appropriate, I think we can address your concern or your point by changing that to and or. Does that seem appropriate? We're, we're open to that. Uh, that seems appropriate to me. I would defer to staff on if that feels appropriate to them as well. Sure. Uh, yeah, we'd be amenable to that language. All right. Great. Let's Thank go you. with that. Thank you. Um, then you also asked about amenities on the site, I believe, if I understood your question correctly. So this is going to be a multifamily community. So I think some of the amenities that you're going to see here would be consistent with what you would see in other multifamily communities. Um, you know, if, if you have an opportunity to go by LDG sites, you will probably drive by them and not realize there's anything different about them um, from a market rate community. So, you know, the expectation is that there'll be a pool and kind of like clubhouse, I would call it community building. Um, there'll be playground, walking paths with benches. There'll be a covered like pavilion for grilling picnic area type of thing. Um, you know, that that's generally what would be planned outside. Um, and then inside the building, the community building, um, you know, they would have food prep area, business center, um, a furnished exercise facility, uh, and meeting space. Now, Related to this question, I think you're asking about the civic space as well. The plan for the civic space is to have it as a second story to what would otherwise be the amenity center for the community. So the second, and you know, that's planned as I think Mr. Coleman spoke to this kind of 5,000 square foot open flex space type of, you know, structure or type of uh, program inside there. So it could be divided, you know, I suppose in any number of ways, but the idea is that it would be, you know, flexible for that. Um, and uh, let me see, I'm looking at my notes here. So I have a couple of follow-ups already. Um, oh, sure. So first off, we, I think specifically with the open space aspect of my questions, um, we've seen language in the past where um, applicants will have some language along the lines of at least three of the following will be provided in the open space. And then they will list off a series of items, a lot of items that you mentioned, a clubhouse, a pavilion, um, a dog park, a playground, those types of things. And so um, I'm curious, I think the kind of more specific question there was if the, if your client would be amenable to including that language to um, ensure that those amenities are part of the development plan and provide some clarity on 
what can be done in the open space. No problem. We can we can make that type of commitment. Okay. Um, great. And then with the civic space. So I've heard the phrase memorandum of understanding before, and I think I like have a vague idea of what that is, but I am not a lawyer and I don't pretend to be one. Um, so I would ask you to kind of help me understand um, what that document is going to accomplish. Um, Cause I'm still a little confused on it. I understand that basically there are three parties that are agreeing to some things, um, but I just, I want to ensure that I want to understand like, I guess the legal nature of that document of. Sure. Well, so uh, let me, yeah. would it be helpful if I could explain like the reason it's necessary? Yes. So some of the items that are being requested are not appropriate for zoning, which means the city can't enforce every type of commitment through its mm -hmm. zoning police power, right? Um, and, and then there are certain items that um, also, you know, would be considered like contract zoning or something like that, which, which are illegal. So, you know, I can tell you that this space is, is intended to be administered by the VFW and, and was planned as 5,000 square feet for the VFW. That's what it was planned for. I can't make that a zoning condition because we can't make a commitment that it's going to be used by a specific entity, right? So the MOU is necessary to outline that the VFW, that we are agreeing to that the civic space would be, you know, administered by the VFW and that the VFW is open to providing um, some of that space as office space for the BCA, right? That's something that can't be accomplished through zoning. It would be illegal and it would be unenforceable by the, by the city. So the MOU is going to cover things like that. Um, and, you know, like programs, that's, that's something that is beyond the purview of like zoning authority from the local government. So you were talking about like an advisory board situation where you have continued cycle of feedback, continuous cycle of feedback. Mm -hmm. That's not something that the city could enforce either, not as a zoning condition, right? So that's what, that's what the MOU is meant to cover is items like that. Okay. Um, I'll just comment that for me, I feel like uh, I know we ask you all to do so much before you come to us and we often ask you to do more before you come to us. Um, I would say like to me for future reference, it would be helpful that if you know that there's going to be an MOU executed to at minimum have like a set of bullet point items of things that might be like a part of that MOU um, to help provide some clarity as to like what's going on because I I take your point that uh, the MOU is because some of these aren't zoning questions um, and I would I just um, the way I tend to think about those types of statements is we're not a zoning board we're a planning board and so we think a little bit more holistically than specifically the zoning just why I sometimes will ask silly questions on commercial sites, like, are you paying living wages? Um, and so it is helpful to at least have that clarity of like what's going on at the site, at least for me personally. Um, but I think I hear what you're saying and that is helpful. And um, I saw Larry Coleman raise their hand again. And um, Larry, I would invite you to provide any comment or color there as well. Okay, thank you for opportunity. And just to clarify, VFW is a veteran, a, a volunteer organization. This is a passion for me. It's the VFW and serving this community is what I want to do as a Durhamite. I want to make it clear that the, there'll be two floors, as Neil said. The second floor will be a rental agreement between LDG and their management company and the VFW. The VFW will be a tenant of that 5,000 square foot facility. And, and we have been working with Bragtown Community Association and other individuals to develop a pretty comprehensive co-op use space plan um, that is a continuing ongoing conversation with Bragtown. 
And while it's not an LDG development, I am working proactively hand in hand with BCA. So we hit the ground running when this space is occupied. Um, so, I mean, and I'd be glad, I know it's outside the purview of the zoning committee, but as citizens of Durham, I can share all the documentation, planning meetings we've been doing, the 12 page business plan kind of proposal we have, um, but I have that available offline, separate from LDG, but just me as a community member and the volunteer of the VFW. Thank you, Larry, that's very helpful. Um, Alexander, I saw you also had your hand raised. Yes, thank you, Chair Amendolia. Yeah, I just wanted to provide a little context on this too. Um, I don't generally provide context on what the applicant's saying, but I think it's probably important in this conversation. Recently, uh, in one of our most recent development Bright Town subcommittee meetings, uh, some of these issues were brought up and uh, there was conversation about what we can and can't do within the regulatory framework. Um, and so as a as a balance sheet or as a compromise, um, this idea was thrown out uh, by staff to engage in a parallel process and a mem memorandum of understanding, understanding that while we, you know, we are a planning department, we're still working under a regulatory environment in the state of North Carolina. And so these things that we would love to see, we can't actually put as a zoning condition. And so this was kind of our way to push towards getting Bright Town Community something they would like um, or need to feel best in the project while at the same time uh, still maintaining the, the, the legal uh, credence of this process. Okay. And so if there's a, uh, if it feels a little bit rushed or last minute, it was a relatively new development. Okay. Um, well, I will say I appreciate the innovative approach and coming up with new solutions to make these things happen. Um, and frankly, it'd be kind of cool to see this happen more often um, because there are other circumstances where I think this would be useful. Um, first off, thank you all for um, allowing me to be a little dense and helping walk me through that. Um, I think the only, the there are two things that hadn't been addressed yet. Um, first off was on the ADA requirements. So uh, my understanding is that there will be some number of units within this that are like dedicated um, accessible units and um, and I think that's based on the live tech requirements so first off I'm curious what those requirements are um, and then what can be done to try and expand those so uh, well chair I assume that question is directed at us as yes. the applicant right? yes okay, all right, so I think the best way for me to answer this question is to just give the example of LDG's community in Raleigh, okay? Now, what we don't know is if there are any local requirements associated with the LIHTC project or whatever that would change the requirements as they were in Raleigh. But in the, in the Raleigh project, what LDG was required to do uh, was 8%, 8% of the units would be ADA with an additional 2% of the units being ADA plus sensory accessible. Um, so that's a total of 10% of the units were required to. Now, th at the Raleigh site, that's what they were required to do. They did beat this. They provided more ADA units than were required. What I can't do is tell you what specifically the requirement, if it's different in Durham, um, I, I don't know that. That's something that, that we still have not gotten clarity on. And we also don't know how many units that uh, we plan for ADA in the building yet. We have submitted a site plan, I believe, but we're not at that stage in the architecture to tell you specifically how many ADA units are gonna be built in this community. Okay, and so I assume that establishing any sort of baseline um, through a proffer um, would be felt as unnecessarily limiting you all during site plan. Well, sure. I mean, I guess I'll put it this way. If we understood and knew what the minimum was, we would commit to that because we're required to do that anyway, right? Right. Well, what we're going to do over that, I can't answer. 
but I also don't know what the minimum requirement is for a project in Durham. The project in Raleigh was at 8% ADA, 2% ADA sensory. Okay. And so I guess it like would, sorry. Um, yeah, and I'll be frank, I don't have the expertise in this to know like what a proper um, amount is like what we should be aiming for. Um, but let's say hypothetically speaking, we wanted to take Raleigh's um, minimum and establish that for this site um, and put that in a proffer that says like a minimum of 8% percent be ADA and 2% ADA plus sensory. Um, is that something that you all would consider or you, and you feel would be appropriate for this stage? Well, I would say it's not something that we would think is appropriate for like today because we just don't know what that number is, but we can make that commitment. As I said, it's already required. We're already planning on meeting the requirement, whatever it is, whether that's through zoning or some other regulatory framework, in this case, the LIHTC program, that's what we'll be meeting. If, if, if that, I think what you're saying is you'd like to see it be incorporated as part of the zoning. We're not opposed to that. We just don't know what the number is. Okay. I would then just ask uh, you to do due diligence on that between now and this going to the elected officials and I think that's um, fair. continue working with Bragtown to uh, consider if the minimum requirement is not sufficient for this case and that we need more. Um, so I would just, I would ask you to continue work on that. Um, and then briefly, because we still have a lot on our agenda and I, I do want to get this to a vote and move forward, but I'm curious if you can speak to the the point I raised about um, ensuring that all of the infrastructure um, is being designed with uh, like human or people oriented both during day and at night and thinking about some of the safety factors involved with that. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't know how to respond to this question. I did talk to my client about it. Um, my client, LDG, they, they have built several communities um, in the nation. Uh, and, you know, they would provide adequate lighting around the site so that people have safe ways to walk and, and you'll feel safe that way. This community, one of the specific features of this community, as was requested by a a number of folks in the area would be a gated community. That actually was not the original plan, but that um, it became apparent that that was, you know, a community desire here. So that would be another safety feature. Um, you know, so I don't, I don't know how to respond to that question specifically, other than that LDG has experience in building uh, multifamily communities and, and, you know, they, they have had, success in their other locations and they have to repeat that here through the same type of uh, features. But, you know, I, I, I don't know if that answers your question. I yeah. recognize I didn't give any specifics and I'm not sure I will be able to, but yeah. is that what you were getting at? Yes. And I, um, I recognize it's a very niche question to be asking. Um, I think what I would ask in this case too is um, to continue having conversations with the Bragton Community Association um, to and to take the time to really understand their concerns on this front, on that front, and um, do your best to help accommodate those. Sure. Great. Um, okay, I've taken up a lot of time. Are there other commissioner comments or questions on this case? Okay, uh, let's try and get this to vote. So I have two proffers that I have written down and remembered. One was um, changing the proffer 6.3 to be and or for both bus stops. And then um, to add a, a proffer helping clarify uh, discussing what can go in the open space that will be provided and what amenities would be provided on site. Um, staff, is there anything that you need that 
I missed or that you need to clarify it on those two? Uh, no, you clarified well and we'll work with the applicant. Uh, we've done language on the active amenities before, so uh, we'll work with the applicant before city council. Thank you. Uh, with that, I would take a motion at this time. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we take base number Z21, uh, 0021, the Dearborn Drive multifamily case uh, with the associated modifications to be forwarded to the city council with favorable re recommendation. Second. Moved by Commissioner Morgan, seconded by Commissioner Cease. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, maybe have the roll call vote. Sure, Amandolio? Yes. Baker? Yes. Busby? Yes. Cameron? Yes. Cutright? Yes. Lowe? Yes. MacGyver? Yes. Morgan? Yes. Cease? Yes. Carmen Williams? Yes. And Zuri Williams? Yes. It passes 11 0. Thank you to staff. Thanks to the applicant. Um, Really, thanks to the applicant. I'm glad to see this coming forward. Um, apologies that we took a little extra time on this, but um, it's an important one and I wanna make sure to get it right. Uh, okay, moving on up next, we have case Z21-0030, Wilkinson Estates. And we'll begin with the staff report. Wonderful, thanks all. Um, and good evening again, Brooke Roper, City County Planning Department. Uh, are you all able to see the presentation now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I'll be summarizing Z21-0030, Wilkinson Estates. The following information summarizes the application. The applicant proposes to change the zoning designation of one parcel of land located, located at 1604 Olive Branch Road, totaling 48.42 acres for a maximum of 185 townhouse units. The current zoning is residential rural. The applicant proposes to change this designation to plan development residential 3.885. The property is currently designated low density residential on the future land use map. And the proposed zoning is consistent with this designation. So the existing zoning is residential rural. The site is rural in nature and is surrounded by undeveloped property to the north uh, zoned PDR 2.944, property zoned RR and property zoned PDR 3.22 uh, to the east with existing single family residential development, uh, vacant property zoned RR to the south and property zoned RR and vacant uh, PDR 2.903 directly to the west with a single family home uh, subdivision development occurring farther west of the site along Doc Nichols Road. So the aerial map shows the general location of the project. The site is located along 1604 Olive Branch Road, and the site is currently undeveloped and primarily wooded with road frontage along the west side of Olive Branch Road. The following photo provides just visual context for the site. The applicant has uh, included graphic and text commitments, including a dog park, play field, community garden, contribution to Durham Public Schools and the City of Durham dedicated housing fund, the installation of five feet of asphalt along the site frontage along the west side of Olive Branch Road for a bicycle lane, along with de other design commitments. And for the full list of commitments, please view attachment E of the staff report. 
uh, 125 and 100 foot intermittent and perennial stream buffer is located on the northern portion of the site, which crosses through the site to the south in two locations, one towards the east and the other towards the west. The proposal includes a potential vehicular crossing per Department of Water Quality and a potential utility stream crossing or potential bicycle pedestrian connection. And the proposal commits to an additional 50 feet of stream buffering for the intermittent stream and 25 feet of additional stream buffering for the perennial stream. There are 2.717 acres of steep slopes identified on the site and the applicant commits to preserving um, 2.3 acres of steep slopes in accordance with the UDO. And there are also approximately 0.7 acres of linear wetlands identified on site, and these wetlands are within the proposed stream buffers. So in the suburban tier, the minimum tree coverage requirement is 20% preservation. And if the site cannot provide the minimum preservation requirements, tree coverage incorporating replacement is allowed within a minimum range of 21 to 25%. Uh, based upon the, uh, the tree preservation or replacement. And so the plan commits to a total of 27% tree preservation or about 13, per, uh, 13 acres with 7% uh, preservation outside of the stream buffers. And the minimum required amount of open space is 16% and the plan commits to approximately 30%. Um, of open space. And I just wanted to note that this is a correction from the staff report. The staff report notes 40%. Um, I uh, just wanted to update it to 30%. Um, and the proposed development will be limited to a maximum of 185 townhouse residential units. So a neighborhood meeting was held in accordance with the UDO requirements on July 12th, 2021. Um, there were 17 community members present and three social pinpoint comments were received by staff in relation to this case. Um, and that's that can be seen in attachment M. So staff determined that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted ordinances and policies. And we are uh, the staff and applicant are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Um, we are going to open the public hearing and begin with the applicant presentation. Um, I, I know Tim Sivers is uh, the applicant on this case, and we have Jennifer Scott and Todd also as part of the applicant team. Um, Tim, you'll have 10 minutes to give your presentation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Todd Alsop, Bruce Knott, and as you said, Jennifer Scott, yes, are all part of our development team. I do have a short presentation. Uh, Brooke, if you could please bring up the PowerPoint presentation, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Chair Amendolia, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Tim Sivers. I'm the president of Corbeth Associates, located at 16 Consultant Place, Durham, North Carolina. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, please, Brooke. Thank you. <clears throat> the proposed development outlined in red on this map includes a maximum of 185 units on just over 48 acres providing a density of 3.885 units per acre. The contiguous residential development will contain a minimum of two different types of townhome units. If you recall, this commission heard the proposal for the project outlined in green in April. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed developments following the current future land use plan for the area with proposing a density of under four units per acre. As you can see, we are not proposing any changes to the future land use map this evening. Next slide, please. The existing zoning for the project area is residential rural, and tonight we're asking for your vote to rezone to PDR 3.885. This request is compatible with the previous approved rezonings in the area of PDR 2.9 and 3.7 to the north, as well as PDR 3.2 to the east and south. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates the development plan for the project. You can see the larger 125 foot perennial stream buffers that staff mentioned and are proposed for this site 
that are in excess of the 100 foot requirement. The green asterisks and plus symbols are spread throughout the project area, which represents preserved tree and steep slope areas. These are located within the stream buffers, but also outside the stream buffers, along Owl Branch Road, as well as along the western property line that will remain undeveloped. There is one vehicular stream crossing identified with the long blue arrow right in the middle of the screen, along with two potential utility stream crossings by the orange arrows. The primary access point will be on Olive Branch Road and become the fourth leg of the intersection with Olive Branch Reserve, the proposed development directly to the east. A secondary optional access point, which will only allow right turns, is located at the southeastern corner of the property. Additionally, three street stubs are proposed to the south to encourage interconnectivity with future development. Next slide, please. Some of the key text commitments include that there will be two different types of townhome units, ranging in a width of 18 to 26 foot in width and size from 1,300 square feet to 2,500 square feet. We've increased the perennial stream buffer width from 100 to 125 foot. 27% tree preservation, and of which seven will be out, 7% will be outside of the stream buffer. This is in excess of the 20% requirement per the UDO and more than the majority of recent developments in this area. A maximum of 30% impervious area, which is, which is much less than the majority of recent developments in the area. 30% open space with active open space requirements of a dog park, play field, as well as a community garden short block lengths, and financial contributions to Durham Public Schools, and dedicated housing funds, all of which are items that have been previously discussed tonight on previous projects. Next slide, please. Additional design commitments, which will promote variation in home appearance, including a variety of building materials, not permitting identical exterior elevations or color palettes on adjacent buildings, provided distinctive, providing distinctive architectural features, and front facade gables while requiring transparent windows and our decorative hardware on all garage doors. One item of clarity I would like to make this evening is that the, the development plan notes no quote home shall be constructed with identical building elevations or color palette. I would like to clarify that that term um, using the word building. So no building shall be constructed with identical building elevations or color palette that's identical to either side of it and we can work those discussions with staff. Uh, next slide, please. The development will also construct multiple road improvements in the area as listed on the development plan. They include a bike lane in the north and northbound left turn lane at the primary access point number one, as shown on this map. The bike lane will continue along the entire frontage access as access point two is proposed to only permit right turns in and out of the subdivision. Approximately one mile to the north, shown here as improvement number three, a northbound left turn lane on Olive Branch Road and traffic signal at this intersection with Doc Nichols Road will be provided. And approximately a mile south near the bottom of the map, an eastbound left turn lane will be constructed on Carpenter Pond Road with a traffic signal at the Carpenter Pond and Olive Branch Road intersection. Next slide, please. In summary, this proposed development follows all UDO regulation, specifically those listed in 3.510 of the UDO. This proposal is compatible with nearby property and recently approved rezonings. It's consistent with the current comprehensive plan, provides commitments towards, propose, towards the proposed small area plan by increasing stream buffer widths, increasing tree preservation areas inside and outside of the now wider stream buffers, and increasing open space areas. This area has available and sufficient utility infrastructure, and this proposal provides over $2 million worth of road improvements. Attachment G of the staff report identifies the schools have sufficient capacity for the impact of this proposed rezoning. And finally, this proposal meets the high demand for housing in our city. Thank you for your time this evening, and I ask that you vote in favor of this project. If I do have any remaining time, I'd like to reserve that to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we're going to move forward to resident comments at this time. Uh, I would just like to state for the record that five people did register, four of which were proponents, one was an opponent. 
Um, most of those individuals indicated they did not want to speak tonight. Um, we had one person sign up to speak in advance, and that was Mimi Kessler. Um, Mimi, you'll have two minutes. If anyone else is hoping to speak on this case, please go ahead and um, raise your hand to get in the queue. Um, but Mimi you may begin your comments at this time. Hi, my name is Mimi Kessler. I live at 1418 Woodland Drive in Durham. Um, there are a lot of very good uh, elements about this proposal. Um, and, and I appreciate that. Um, I thought it was interesting that he said there was $2 million worth of road improvements, some of which are not contiguous to the, um, to the, the property, which is good. Um, again, I have concerns about, uh, the water and sewer and, uh, they're making an effort about trees, which I acknowledge. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the, the contributions to the school and the affordable housing um, are, are so low that um, I really think that they should not be considered. Uh, $5,000 is not enough to do anything with. And, and I, 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 I find those types of, um, and because it, it does not take into consideration uh, that this severe need that we have um, and the expected profit that they will enjoy. Um, so I, I guess I, I leave it up to all of you as to how, how to vote, but I, um, I do like some of the things about this, but I do, do think that we're developing too much. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Are there other individuals who would like to speak on this case? If so, please virtually raise your hand at this time. If you're on the phone, please do that by pressing star nine. Okay, seeing none, uh, Tim, you had about three minutes and 30 seconds left of your time if you would like to make any additional comments or response. Uh, sure, I'd just like to follow up with the... Uh... Uh, sure, I'd just like to follow up with the uh, water and sewer uh, concerns that uh, Ms. Kessler brought up. Um, so this area, as the planning board is, is aware, is um, part of the Searles Regional Basin, um, Southeast Regional Lift Station area, uh, relatively brand new, if you will, um, construction of the pump station. Um, so there is plenty of uh, sewer capacity. Um, there will be extensions that have to be made, but there's plenty of sewer capacity as well as water. Um, water will be extended to site through our utility extension agreement, which will provide adequate water for not only drinking, but pressurized for fire flow. Um, and those items will be reviewed in more detail and calculations during construction documents and site plan, um, but there is adequate uh, infrastructure referring to water and sewer. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Okay, seeing no other individuals that would like to speak, um, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing and open it up for commissioner comment and question. seeing none, um, which is always the interesting sign. Um, I will comment that I don't typically like development in this area. Um, with this case, I find myself wondering if this is the best case scenario for this site, given its environmental sensitivity and we're, we're getting a surprisingly low um, percentage of impervious surface um, on this site, and we are getting decent density. Um, I would like to see more commitment to affordable housing. Um, you know, we've hit the point many times that donations to the affordable housing fund are just like a drop in the bucket and don't really substantively contribute to our affordable housing stock. And so I would 
prefer to see more there. Um, I think I did have a question for Tim. Um, so this proposed sales price um, that you have on here, is that is that the number that y'all underwrote when you submitted this? Case? Yes, yes, of course. Um, and uh, ask me tomorrow and you'll have a different answer. Um, as we all are well, well aware. Um, I would anticipate, and, and, and as the previous um, you know, cases here tonight, um, kind of the best way to answer this question is if there was a house for sale there today, what would it be priced at? Um, and, and that's the you know, most accurate information we can give. And I would, I would assume these townhomes would be in the three to four hundreds, likely in the starting in the low threes. Uh, again, if it was for sale today, uh, but we know that changes every hour lately. Yeah. And was there any consideration of uh, five to ten percent dedication of affordable units? Uh, no, the, the the affordable housing donation here is um, the uh, part of that. Okay. Um, so those are all my questions. Does anybody else have questions or comments before we move this forward to a vote? I'm seeing none. I did actually, I, uh, Alexander, I did note that um, Tim mentioned a clarification on the language of one of the proffers where it referred to no two no homes next to each other would be um, of the same palette and wanting to clarify that that's meant to be building. Um, does staff have what they need on that front? Yes, thank you, Chair uh, Amadolia. Yes, uh, switching the language to building would be more appropriate and staff supports that. Okay. Great, so I'll just note that any motion we make needs to include that. I'm seeing no further comments, so I would accept a motion at this time. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we take case number Z21000 Wilkinson Estates with the appropriate modification that was noted uh, to be forwarded to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Moved by Commissioner. Morgan seconded by Commissioner Lowe. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, maybe have the roll call vote. Amendoia. Yes. Baker. No. Busby. No. Cameron. No. Cut right. No. Low. No. MacGyver. No. Morgan. No. Cease. No. Uh, Carmen Williams. No. And Zuri Williams. No. Okay, it fails. It, the motion fails 110. Thank you all. Um, and thanks for helping us get back on time track. Um, we're going to move on to our next case. That's case Z21000, 637, and 644 Can Canover. And we'll begin with the staff report. Thank you, Chair Amendolia. I've been saying Conover, so I'm not sure. <laughs> um, you might be right. I don't. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Um, all right. So, hello again, uh, Brooke Roper, City County Planning Department. Um, the following information again summarizes this application. The applicant proposes to change the zoning designation of one parcel of land located at 637 and 641 Conover Road, totaling 
nine to six acres to allow for the subdivision of two existing lots into four lots. The current zoning is residential rural and the applicant proposes to change this designation to residential suburban eight. The property is currently designated low density residential on the future land use map. The proposed zoning is inconsistent with this designation. So if the proposed zoning is approved, staff, staff recommends a change to the flum designate to, to the flum to designate the property as low medium density residential. The existing zoning is residential rural, as I noted before, and the site is surrounded by residential rural and residential suburban eight areas. The aerial map shows the general location of the project. The site is currently vacant and primarily wooded. Access to the site is located on the western side of the property from Conover Road. The site is surrounded by RR with single family homes in the Ravenstone neighborhood to the west and additional single family homes to the east. Properties just north and south of the site are RR as well, but are currently undeveloped. No development plan is proposed, therefore all uses and associated use limitations in Article 5 use regulation shall apply to the zoning dis district proposed. A neighborhood meeting was held in accordance with uh, UDO requirements on June 2nd, 2021, with five community members president, present. Uh, one social pinpoint comment was received by staff in relation to this case seen in attachment I from an, an opponent, which notes that there are too many houses in Ravenstone development now uh, to add more just adds to the area uh, overburdened roads in the area of this proposed development. Uh, except for the future land use designation, staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted ordinances and policies. If the request is approved, the FLUM designation shall be amended to maintain consistency. Staff and the applicant are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Um, at this time, we're gonna go ahead and open the public hearing and we'll begin with the applicant presentation. Uh, I think I have 10 minutes. Uh, Rachel, um, Chris, can you remind me who the applicant was? I know we didn't have that clarified in our note earlier. Uh, Jay Galisi. Okay, thank you. Um, Jay Galisi, um, you'll have 10 minutes for your presentation and you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Barbara Todd. I'm a colleague of Mr. Galise's. Uh, I'm a land planner, landscape architect. Uh, we have. Um, Give me address. We are at 4020 West Chase Boulevard in Raleigh. Well, you've had some complicated cases tonight, and um, this is fairly straightforward. I hope. There are two existing lots on Conover Road. The proposal, and we hope that you will be able to support it, is to subdivide the two lots into four lots. Those four lots will be identical in size to the lots across Conover Road from uh, our proposed subdivision. There's a sidewalk on the west side of Conover Road public utilities are available. Um, we were asked at the neighborhood meeting for some information about house prices. Um, at that time, and indeed right now, we do not have that information. The proposal is to rezone the property, uh, put the lots on the market, um, just the lots, and then uh, assuming a builder will purchase the lots and build a home. So I would like to be able to answer the neighbor's questions about house price, but I don't have the information. Um, but we do know that the lots, the new lots that are proposed will appraise for a significant amount more than the existing lots are right now. So what we're, what we're asking for is to subdivide two lots into four, um, they will be identical in size to what's existing across the street. And uh, 
um, public utilities are available and the sidewalk across the street. If you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move to a resident comment and question. Let's see, I have one person who signed up to speak in advance. That's Mimi Kessler. Um, Mimi, you are hitting your stride at this point, so you'll have two minutes um, to make your comments. Thank you. Thank you. This is Mimi Kessler. I live at 1418 Woodland Drive in Durham. Um, I uh, withdraw my need to ask questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. And then, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember. You, you said you, the person who is listed as Rachel Gage, I remember um, it wasn't Rachel, um, but you may have your two minutes at this time as well. And if anyone else wants to speak on this case, please go ahead and raise your hand. Hello, my name is Keith Davis. I live at 108 Grandamere Court in Durham. Um, I used to be the president of this HOA Ravenstone. Um, now I'm the treasurer. Um, the concerns that we have on that property being built is going to be built right on, in our um, homeowners um, association. Uh, we would like to know if they're going to join our homeownership or are they going to be different from our homeownership? Now, with that, if they're not joining our HOA, then that means we really have no say so with the covenants as far as what they do with their property, which is also going to affect the rest of my homeowners on Conover, Conover Road. And it is Conover. Um, <laughs> uh, but yes, it would affect everybody on Conover if they're not seeping into or going to add into our HOA. The next problem that we have as a board is that are they going to be paying into the storm drain? Um, we have a wetland area right on right on Conover and Rondelay um, that was just basically bequeathed to us by the city about two years ago, and we haven't maintained. And I know they're going to tie in those four those four houses into that property, and we also we pay for that. So we would have a concern about course sharing on the wetland, the BM, what is it, the BMP. Um, that area right there. And also with construction, we also would like to know about construction because we have another property down the road by, um, I think it was MFW, who purchased two lots also on Conover, and they just came in and just tore up the street and didn't give anybody any notice. Um, I was on that street myself when they was ripping it up and I had to ask the construction guy, hey, could you put something down so the lady can get out of her driveway? Um, it's, to, we don't, uh, we're not opposed to having them come into the community. We would just like to have some type of control over those four lots because they are right. And then our amenities, they're going to want to use our amenities. And that's going to be an issue as well. Thank you. So those are the concerns that uh, the Ravenstone HOA has. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Barbara, you had about seven minutes left of your time. Um, so I would like to provide you an opportunity to make any additional comment or response if you would like. Thank you. We don't anticipate joining the Ravenswood Homeowners Association. Um, these are just, these are two independent lots and it is not uh, the client's intention to join that homeowners association. As for the other matter of the storm drainage, it's certainly something that I can bring up with the client and uh, try to get some more information about that. But I don't know at this point whether uh, there's a willingness to join in the fund for the maintenance of the stormwater facility. I just don't have that information right now. Um, and Barbara, while yes. you have some time right now, could you also speak to the construction question and if there's anything that you can do or, um, yeah, anything you can speak to around how the construction will be handled so that it's not overly disruptive to the residents? Um, the intention certainly would be to follow standard construction practices. I don't know why uh, a road would have been torn up 
um, in the construction um, of, on an existing street. Uh, the, the, other than to connect utilities, which would be in the street, the water line would be in the street. But other than that, um, it doesn't make sense to me that something would be torn up to the extent that somebody's driveway would be inaccessible. And we would, and we would replace it. If it were and obviously, if there's any disruption or damage in the street that would affect a property owner, um, this client would, would be responsible for fixing that. Okay, thank you. Um, I see no other individuals looking to speak on this case at this time. So I am going to close the public hearing and open this up to commissioner comment and question. Commissioner Busby. Thanks, Chairman Dolia. Uh, this is just a comment. I, it's, uh, I appreciate the concerns that are being raised by the Homeowners Association. I think they're really valid, and I appreciate you coming and sharing those with us. Uh, and, and I understand that the applicant may not be able to give an answer tonight. I, I'm inclined to vote tonight on this case to move it forward, uh, unless I hear anything from my fellow commissioners. I'm planning to support it, but I really hope that uh, this will take usually two cycles or 60 days to reach the governing body. In this case, uh, this is, uh, I guess this will go to city council. And uh, I, I hope that there will be a, a very clear answer on the question from the applicant to the community around uh, the, you know, the, the shared responsibility for the, the neighborhood's amenities, which would include the wetlands, but also just uh, how you are going to interact with each other, because you are going to be neighbors, even if you're not in the homeowners association. I know the governing body will ask those questions as well. So uh, I just want to share with my commissioners. I plan to vote for it to move it forward, but I definitely want that the 60 days to be used for hopefully some further discussions and some real clarity to be able to answer the concern that I think is very valid from the homeowners association about how are you going to work together as a neighborhood, especially with the shared amenities that, that you're going to have as a community. So uh, thank you, Chairman Dahlia. Thank you. Commissioner Morgan. Yeah, just a comment. I kind of echo uh, Commissioner uh, Busby's comments about encouraging the applicant to consider uh, being a good neighbor and also actually lever leveraging some of the things with the homeowners association and what they brought up. Uh, I think that's particularly important, particularly since it is part of the community and part of that area, it would be a good uh, thing as well. And I'll, I'll put that in my comments as well uh, to the elected officials. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments or questions? Commissioner Cease. Thank you. I'll just make a quick comment that may be slightly different or slightly nuanced from the two, um, my two previous colleagues who just spoke. And that is surely um, these lots will be fronting and will be a part of the neighborhood in terms of access. Um, but I think the, the HOA question just warrants care and attention. I don't know the history of the parcelization um, but I, but just looking at the topography, um, these lots would, would not flow into, um, the wetland that was referenced. They flow, uh, to the east and down a string corridor that appears to be off of the, um, uh, off of the, uh, drainage area that's referenced and serviced by the HOA's, um, devices. Uh, it doesn't mean they won't still be there accessing. Um, the lots via this neighborhood, but um, I don't know. I, I um, it, it has frontage and, and certainly like matches like in parcel size um, with is, is what's being proposed, like matching like in terms of some relationship with the HOA uh, and or covenants and or amenities. Uh, I, I um, 
you know, I, I don't, I don't feel strongly either way in that regard. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Commissioner Cease. Um, I see Barbara Todd, you've raised your hand again. Um, Barbara, did you want to add any additional comment? And Barbara, you're currently muted. Um, if you are making comment. There it is. Sorry about that. Okay. Technology has kind of passed me by. Um, I just wanted to very quickly say that I appreciate Commissioner Busby's and Commissioner Morgan's comments. We will definitely go back to our client and raise this issue and see um, how we can, in fact, be a good neighbor. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for that. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from commissioners? Um, I'm going to come to commissioners or in just a moment, um, but I do see that Keith Davis raised his hand, and so I want to. Um, I I'll just ask Keith directly. Um, is that um, like your thoughts on that? And if you had any additional comments you wanted to add. Yeah, the only thing that I have with that was, um, like I said, we would invite them to come. I mean, similar elevation, um, property value point, par price point, that's great. But the only thing is if they're selling, if they're building these four lots, right, and then they're going to sell them, what is the continuity of what, what we're asking for being good neighbors? Because right now, yeah, we can say that, but when they sell the lots to whoever they sell them to, that's a whole nother ball game. That's just the point that the HOA is taking it from because we, we can say, yeah, we're going to be good neighbors to you, but guess what? We're selling the property. We're not going to be there <laughs> to, to, to keep this good neighborship going. So then it comes upon us coming back again with whoever's going to actually buy and build it, those four lots. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Keith. Uh, Commissioner Zuri Williams. Um, that was somewhat to my point, um, you know, potentially, I, I know that they had mentioned that they're essentially just going to sell the lots um, once they are subdivided, if they're subdivided. Um, and it may be worth, um, you know, putting some restrictive covenants in place in advance, um, as well as, uh, you know, potentially, I don't know, working with one particular builder instead of, you know, them all being kind of one-offs. Um, and, and, you know, to kind of work with the neighborhood and find some level of uniformity in it all. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I'll just echo everything um, that folks have said. Um, I don't typically get very in the weeds of the, the goings on of HOAs, but I think this seems like a case where revisiting, establishing a relationship there um, is important, um, particularly if there's the potential to create undue burden on the HOA um, by not joining the HOA. Um, so I would just encourage there to be continued conversations on that front. And it sounds like this would be definitely raised in comments to the elected officials. So I would just note that if will be brought to their attention and um, worth your time to look further into that. Uh, seeing no further comments or questions, um, I would take a motion at this time. Mr. Chair, I will uh, entertain a motion to case number Z21-0034, which is 634. 637 and 641 Conover uh, to be forwarded to the, it looks like a, there's an annexation, so be forwarded to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. It moved by Commissioner Morgan, seconded by Vice Chair Cameron. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, may we have the roll call vote. 
Sure. Um, Amendoya? Yes. Baker? Yes. Busby? Yes. Cameron? Yes. But right. Yes. Lowe? Yes. MacGyver? Yes. Morgan? Yes. Cease? Yes. Carmen Williams? Yes. Zuri Williams? Zuri Williams? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. It passes 11 0. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to our last case of the night. Um, this is case Z21 0038, 812 North Mangum Street. Um, and we'll begin with the staff report. Right. Good evening, y'all. Share my screen here. I'm Alexander Cahill again. Thank you for staying with us tonight. Um, the City County Planning Department. This is our last case for tonight. It's 812 North Mangum Street, KC 21 0038. Uh, we received an application from Dan Jewell of Coulter Jewell and Thames, PA. Uh, to rezone a property at 812 North Mangum Street. The existing zoning is commercial general and they are proposing to rezone to commercial info with a development plan. The site is 0.149 acres, so it's a small urban infill site uh, with existing development. The current flum is commercial and there'll be no change to the flum. Uh, there is no zoning overlays for this site. And the reason is to uh, repurpose the uh, main, the existing buildings or maintain them uh, for commercial use. Uh, the site is surrounded by, excuse me, the, the site is surrounded uh, by uh, the zoning to the south that's commercial uh, or to the north that's commercial, to the east that's residential suburban multifamily um, and commercial neighborhood to the west. Um, as you can see in the aerial site, again, this is a urban infill site already built out, already has been repurposed, uh, and they are looking to expand or maintain the existing use. Uh, this is a text only development plan. Right now, text only development plans limit the potential uses. For this text only development plan, the applicant is proposing to limit the uses to retail, food and beverage, and or a collaborative workspace. Uh, it is within the New Server Basin, Ellery Creek Watershed. It's not in a watershed overlay. It's not with any flood hazards or floodplain. There's no streams on the site, no steep slopes, no wetlands, and no open space requirement. There is an existing commercial use on the site already as noted. A uh, neighborhood meeting was held in accordance with the UDO requirements on August 10th, 2021. Eight community members were in attendance, and we received one social pinpoint comment on this case. Uh, the applicant is available to answer your questions as the staff this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, I'm going to open the public hearing. We'll begin with the staff presentation, or sorry, the applicant presentation. Um, Dan Jewell uh, and Joe Wilson and Martin Coulter are the applicant team. Um, Dan, I assume you'll be the one leading the presentation. You'll have 10 minutes to give your presentation. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chair, are you able to hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, I will give the uh, the presentation. The others are available to answer questions if, if needed. Uh, again, Dan Jewell with CJTPA. We are the landscape architects assisting uh, uh, Dr. Wilson and his partners who have reached, uh, purchased purchased this building. Uh, the request is is simply to uh, to change the zoning designation um, if you're familiar with this stretch of North Mangum Street, there are several old uh, commercial light industrial buildings. This particular building for many years, if I remember, was a electric motor repair shop. And then for a while it was uh, Tim Werrell's Metal Artisan Studio, if any of you know of his work. Uh, but over the years, uh, the, uh, uh, the desired uses for these buildings have changed. Uh, the uh, 
the, the, the biggest uh, advantage to going from general commercial to CI, commercial infill, you probably don't see a lot of these. CI is, is uh, specifically intended to create a uh, transitional, small scale commercial use opportunity uh, in and around downtown adjacent to existing single family neighborhoods. Our uh, first request to uh, the planning department was that we actually bring this into the uh, downtown tier because it is literally the next parcel outside of the, the downtown tier. They said, no, we are not really ready to do that right now. So we suggested commercial infill. The main reason for uh, commercial infill and, and the advantage here is that if you work with an existing building and don't expand it, uh, the change of use does not require having to put in parking. As you can imagine, a commercial building of this size, we would have to fill the entire backyard and then some with pavement and new parking spaces to meet the uh, ordinance requirement for parking. Uh, we don't think that's a good use of this site. We don't think it's respectful to runoff to the neighbor's vegetation, things of that nature. So, uh, and, and just to let you know, if you've been out there, there is on street parking on Mangum Street, uh, very, very urban that it is and, and a good sidewalk con connectivity, good pe pedestrian connectivity. So uh, we have limited the uses as uh, Mr. Cahill said. And uh, again, our request is simply to change this from uh, commercial general to uh, uh, commercial infill which by any stretch of the ordinance is, is actually a down zoning, a less intense zoning from the, uh, the general commercial. So uh, that concludes our presentation. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you might have and uh, hopefully you will uh, agree that this is more in keeping with, uh, with the kind of stuff that we wanna see in and around the edges of downtown Durham. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we have one person sign up to speak on this case. That is Mimi Kessler. Um, Mimi, you'll have two minutes to make your comment. And if anyone else wants to speak on this case, please go ahead and queue yourself up by raising your hand at this time. Um, Mimi, you may begin. Thank you very much. My questions have been answered. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this case? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and turn this over to Commissioner Conant and questions. Commissioner Busby. Thanks, Chairman Dolia. Uh, Dan, thanks for the presentation. I, I, oddly enough, and I was sorry to see it, I just saw in today's news that the, the Jet Plane Coffee establishment that was noted as the app, the, uh, the, the current uh, person in this building, they just permanently, they announced they're permanently closing. So that, I just wanted to ask, does that change anything or is this still the intention to still want to move forward with this rezoning request? It, it does not change anything. And I think, uh, I think Jet Plane was actually in the building directly south of this one. Okay. Uh, my client, uh, Dr. Wilson can confirm that, but no, Jet Plane was not in this building. And, and all of us are disappointed that uh, that they close down and, and hopefully somebody else uh, similar will be able to move into that spot. A big loss. Okay. Yeah, I agree. No, thanks for the clarification. I, I think I got confused when I saw their note in here and then I conflated the two together. So that's very helpful. Uh, but that was my only question. I, I, I have no issue with this. I think this makes a lot of sense. So I plan to vote for it. Commissioner Cease. I, I have a question uh, for either the applicant or for staff. What's the distinction between shared workspace versus office? Or more explicitly, what's the implications of that distinction? I can give it a, a shot. Uh, uh, our, our intent uh, is that it would be a uh, like a, uh, a co-working space or even a small um, uh, like an executive office suite, I think you've seen those where folks can rent, a, you know, sort of a, <laughs> I, I hate to disparage it by using this term, but a, a very mini version of uh, 
something similar to WeWork, where you can have a shared conference room and that sort of thing. And then folks, uh, if they only need 200 square feet of office, they can get 200 square feet of office. I guess my question is more around the idea of if, if one office tenant was to want to lease the entire thing, um, independent of the owner's desires, um, are we setting up a scenario where this would have to come back for a rezoning? We are not. We believe that the way we have it set up is in line with the way we treat collaborative workspaces per the UDO and past interpretations. Collaborative workspaces and, 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 and if it was all just one tenant, that would be fine. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all my questions. I think it's a, a positive, positive uh, move forward for the property. Repurposing without reparking. Uh, uh, any other questions and comments? Okay. Um, seeing none, I also feel like this is straightforward and a positive use of the um, site. Uh, so I'm in favor of this. Um, and I would accept a motion at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I make a motion that we take case number Z21-0018-812 North Mangum Street to be forwarded to the city with a positive uh, recommendation. Second. Uh, moved by Commissioner Morgan, seconded by Vice Chair Cameron. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, may we have the roll call vote. Amendoya? Yes. Baker? Yes. Busby? Yes. Cameron? Yes. Cutright? Yes. Lowe? Yes. MacGyver? Sorry, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Cease? Yes. Carmen Williams? I think you skipped me, uh, Grace. Oh, I did. I'm so sorry. Um, I'll go back to you. Uh, Carmen Williams? <laughs> yes. I apologize. All right, thank you. Let me go back to Morgan. Yes. And Zuri Williams? Yes. All right, thank you. It passes 11-0. Thank you. Thanks, staff, and thanks to the applicant. Um, Thank you. I am shocked that we are through all of our public hearings at 9 o'clock p.m. Uh, great work, everyone. Um, so a old business, um, just a reminder to both residents, but also everyone else, we have another meeting next week, uh, June 23rd at 5.30 p.m. Um, and uh, Grace, is there an anticipation of multiple meetings in July or are we still slated for just one? Um, we are only planning one meeting in July. Okay, great. Um, I don't, I don't, I think we're doubling up just this month for now. Um, I don't foresee us doubling up anytime again, unless we double up in the fall because of the comp plan, I'm trying to keep those hearings or, you know, that act, those meetings separate from the regular agenda items. But um, I think we're good through at least August with single meetings okay. for, for public hearings. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, Grace, I know we had a couple of items we wanted to touch on, um, but before then, um, Car uh, Commissioner Carmen Williams, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, I just wanted to know if uh, someone could send out where we're supposed to send the public comments to. Um, well, I'm sorry, not public comments, but our votes and comments and stuff, because I know that there's been some staff changes and I don't want to bombard people who are already overwhelmed. Thanks. Sure, happy to email out in, um, and uh, actually we need the decision forms for this meeting, I think still, but uh, Terry Elliott is, if you're not using the decision forms, you can email your comments directly to Terry Elliott, but we will remind you all and send you an email in the morning. Great, thank you. Um, Grace, I think 
Do you have do we have a couple of items to discuss um, briefly before signing off? I'm trying to unmute, but my my mouse wouldn't move. Sorry. Um, yes. Yeah, so we wanted to, if you didn't mind, um, staff was wondering if if you all would um, entertain a um, a recommendation or well a request both a request from us and a recommendation on how to handle our request. Our request is we would really like to cut back on the paper that we use. We were we are running um, just a lot of copies for these meetings and uh, and we really do want to give you the information that you need so that you can uh, act accordingly we were just wondering if you would if you you know if um uh, meet in the middle recommend uh kind of compromise and we were recommending maybe that we just cut back to providing the agenda for you all and the development plan i know you cannot print a development plan most of you probably can't print it on your home printer um and i'm not sure you know what kind of setup most of you have but um, didn't know if you would be willing to forego the staff reports. Um, they're awfully thick and long when we copy them. Our staff sometimes spends an entire day at the copier, um, copying and compiling these um, agenda packets. And we really would like to go more digital if possible. Um, if it's a problem, you know, feel free to speak up and say so. We don't want to um, make things hard on you or make it where you cannot perform your duties as a commissioner. So, um, but I was just wondering, would any would any of you be willing to um, go that route, or is there any reason, or should we still continue to provide packets to those that have requested full packets? So I'm going to go on mute now and let uh, the chair conduct the discussion. Yes, thanks, Grace. And I would say, um, maybe shockingly, since I'm one of the younger people on this commission, I have been one of the folks that have just like been into the paper copies because uh, I, you know, I like having, it's similar to having a book. It's sometimes easier to have the hard copy. Um, but I will say having heard the staff experience side of making those copies, um, which was surprising for me, I'm going to make the shift on that. Um, and I think uh, to me, this is a reasonable request. I know, um, one of the challenges, I, what I would acknowledge is in a virtual world, it's a bit tougher to be looking at your a screen with the cases while you're in the meeting. Um, so I acknowledge that and I am hoping we go back to in-person soon. And I think that will make life a bit easier where you can have a laptop with you and um, view the documentation without um, like, yeah, without it interfering with your virtual meeting. Um, but I'm going to make the shift and I'd encourage other folks to consider. Um, I obviously get the value of the paper, like I've enjoyed it, but um, want to try and free up staff time and um, yeah, use resources better. That's just me. Um, Commissioner Busby. Thank you, Grace. I, I'm, I've been with the chair on this, but for me, it's always been about the development plan. So what you suggested makes a lot of sense to me. If we get those hard copies of the development plans that are really hard to read on the computer, uh, easy for me to say because next week's my final meeting and then I'm term limited. But I, I think I know the staff's working really hard and if we can save you time, I read a lot of this stuff. I get packets sometimes where something's missing or only one side's printed and I end up going online anyway and reading it online. So I think it makes sense from my perspective. Thank you. Commissioner Morgan. Uh, Commissioner Morgan, you're on mute. I'm, I'm speaking to those that are actually do get theirs digitally. I actually do that. I, of course, I have a couple monitors that I actually look at the, the one on one side and, and also uh, speak to the uh, Zoom call at the same time. But I do think it's really valuable because it is real helpful because a lot of times I'm browsing for the address and location, even on Google Maps or something like that, in addition to while the uh, meeting is going on. So I think there's a lot, once you get adept to it, I think it actually works out pretty well. So I'm speaking for it. And I will just uh, to that point, if I could convince the city to provide us some sort of tablet, I would 
do that. And um, I frankly might start pushing for that a little bit because it would be nice to um, have something, especially if you don't already have one of those, um, um, because I know that that can be incredibly helpful. Even a, even a second monitor or something like that, where those are relatively cheap. So I don't know whether compared to the copying costs that we have to go through. Um, that's a good point. Uh, Grace, did you want to add anything? Sure, thank you. Um, so a couple of things there. Um, we have talked about piloting a program where we supply some kind of um, device. <clears throat> We will talk more about that and I will let you know what we come up with. But I will say, um, so two things and two other things. Um, when, and when we do go back in person, there are monitors at the de the desks for each chair in the planning, um, in the city council chambers where the planning commissioners could see the items on the small monitors. So when we go back in person, that that's, will be super helpful. Um, I, and at this point, we don't know when we're going back in person, but as soon as I know, or I get the 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 go ahead. I'll let the commissioners know. Um, the, the last I heard, the city council and um, had, had wanted us to stay um, virtual for now until you know further notice while the order is still active. Um, and the other thing is, um, if we if if all of you will, um, if there's a consensus, and I know I think Vice Chair Cameron had her hand up, so I'm going to finish up quickly here. But if there's a consensus um, on this, we'd like to provide everybody the same thing because what we've been doing is providing copies to some, but not everyone, and that's really kind of hard to keep up with, to be honest. So if 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 we agree on what we're going to provide, we would we would actually provide the same thing to everyone. So everyone would get copies of the de development plans in the mail along with the agenda. Um, whether you want it or not, you'll just get it because it will be easier for us to, 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 tra to track and just faster for us to copy than to have to figure out who doesn't get one and then, you know, which label goes on which envelope and whatever. So um, that was the last point I wanted to make and then I'll go on mute again. I'm Vice Chair Cameron. Oh, I was just gonna say, I didn't even know that getting hard copies was an option because I've never gotten <laughs> I've always just used my second monitor here, you know, virtually. And I would say to me, what might, the only thing I might want in advance, which we don't get is the PowerPoint presentation that's given by the staff, because that's a nice succinct summary that is easier to follow than going through 104 pages on some of them. And that's only like five pages. And if that was mailed out or emailed out or whatever, that would be awesome. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, Commissioner Cease. Uh, so I um, have uh, developed quite a, a um, means of working with the paper copies that are shared but there are substantial portions that are less necessary in my view. Um, and I'll say this as an architect and as a civil engineer, I really wish more people in the design professions would use paper because a lot of stuff gets lost digitally and a sense of scale gets lost digitally. And that's uh, just hugely important in terms of design. Um, so I'm, my, my vote would be if we could uh, maybe include this, the, the staff report and the development plan and exclude some of the appendices like the TIAs and anytime there's water or sewer information. But I, I really find, you know, certain elements to be helpful and it's in the marking up of those elements to flag. And, and I'm, um, I suppose I could print elements out. Um, but that's, that's just, that's just where I am. Can I ask a clarifying question on that? Um, I understand and relate to that on the development plan side. Are you also indicating that like, the zoning and plum maps that we get printed as well that you like having the print copy of those because the zoning the, the, the zoning the plum maps and and just the staff summary not the engagement summaries not the tia not the water and sewer analysis is when those are included um, because those can if particularly for large projects be pretty lengthy um but but i, I don't i don't know and i i maybe i could parse it out more succinctly, but if others don't need any of that information, I, I guess I can I can learn to live with it. I do work with more monitor with two monitors, but I'm usually as as one of the others said, I think it was Commissioner Morgan said, I'm usually um, you know, looking up the site or looking up uh, 
GIS information about the site. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. Um, Commissioner Cutright. Just a quick um, follow up, something that Commissioner C said that sparked the question. Um, how do we determine, and I guess this is for staff, um, like, like what this report consists of, how it's organized, um, and do you or have you gotten uh, explicit feedback to say, you know, I guess one question is who else uses this? Um, and then, um, uh, have you gotten feedback from all the users to say this would potentially be better or is this already prescribed somewhere else that says this is everything that has to be in this report and you know for a particular reason whether it's legal or or otherwise do you want um, me to you, you got uh, it Chris? I mean I'll take a stab at it and then you can back you can jump in um so um, we've prepared their staff reports and the packets based on what, what we were told folks needed over the years. But we also, the reason we have all the attachments is because if we reference something in the report, you know, feel like you need to see the attachment so you understand what we're referencing. Um, you know, we have tried to, to streamline and I think, and I think Alex, I think I'll know what Alexander's probably going to say. So I'm going to let him speak for himself. We plan to do some more, um, you know, work in that regard with the item, the agenda items. So, um, but yeah, I'll go on mute now and let Alexander talk. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was going to say, if you have ideas on things you want to see in the staff reports, I think this is an opportunity. Uh, I'm definitely a process improvement person and I want these to work for the community and for y'all. I feel like there's a lot of things that are performative that we do that don't need to be. Um, and so I'd like to take those out. I'd like to just have the things that we need that will help you make the right decision. So if you could pass that feedback on to Austin, sorry, Austin, and he will, uh, he will crowdsource it and send it to me. Um, I can work to incorporate it. I will say staff has already been working on an update to the staff reports that's very different and has more of a hybrid approach. So if you do get your uh, packet virtually, you'll be able to just click on hyperlinks. Uh, if you want it over paper, then we'll provide the attachment. So um, that's kind of what we're moving towards. But yeah, feedback sent to Austin. We will make these better um, because it's not working for staff either, to be honest. Um, Alexander, I wanted to add on to that if, you, if you're amenable. Um, and we could send out a survey and just ha and have you fill out the survey and it can come straight back to us. Um, and then we can share the results of what you want to see in these reports, what's meant to you. Um, because we do plan to make some changes and this is an excellent time to, to do that. And so um, if that might be easier than Austin trying to um, shuffle it, you know, through to us, but we're, we could do that as well. Yeah, I was actually, that was something I thought about earlier, was requesting a survey for this. Um, we'll get it out Friday. Great, I was gonna say something else and I'm trying to remember that. Oh, I was gonna say, I did, Alexander sent me um, the draft updated version of the staff report during this meeting and I took like a quick glance at it. And I would just say initially, Alexander, it looks much better. It uses a bunch of tables to summarize the data instead of paragraphs. And as someone who works in consulting, I'd love a good table instead of a paragraph. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. And it was very easy to read. Um, so I think that is gonna be a vast improvement. Um, Yeah, so we don't have to make a decision tonight. Um, we've got some time now. We've already sent the packets out for June 23rd. So let us send out the survey and we'll we'll get something out to you, um, like Alexander said, end of week that um, can give us some can give some guidance on what we need to do here. So maybe we everyone wins or at least sort of wins and doesn't lose all the way around. <laughs> so um, if that's a term, does that work for everyone or did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, that works for me. I think um, I look, y'all. I know we're asking a lot of everybody on this commission uh, the next few months. Um, so um, I don't mean to ask more, but if y'all could just respond to that survey fairly quickly, because it would, I think it would be ideal to be able to close the loop at our meeting next week. Um, so 
yeah, I would just ask people to try and respond quickly to that. It seems like the best approach to me. Um, yeah. Do we have anything else, Grace? I feel like we might have had a second item, but that might be my brain's foggy. <laughs> I don't think so. We talked about um, we talked about the the agenda packets, and we and you went ahead at the beginning of the meeting and mentioned the um, text amendments and the that we're, we're um, definitely making uh, steps and efforts to be what, much more transparent with all text amendments, not just uh, privately initiated. So we're slowly building the uh, pages on the SPP site, and we'll get them added to the website this week and send you all those links so you can share with whomever you like to share with and. Um, We'll also send out a blast uh, as far as the weekly um, newsletter that goes out from planning every Friday. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to everyone who serves on this role. Um, I know this month's intense. We'll see you next week. Hope you get some rest between now and then. Um, yeah, I appreciate you all. This meeting is adjourned at 9.18 p.m. That's awesome. <laughs> Bye.